hours of stupidity out of its way. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Cleveland Moto Podcast, episode number 455, also an Oldsmobile engine. Yeah. And uh, Light them up, boys. Hold on, hold on, just one second. I want to say. Don't get ahead of yourself. I just want to say. Say it. Our light them up ritual yeah. that we've been doing for 11 years yeah. sucked last week. Yeah, uh -oh. I listened to it for quality control. Uh, I heard Ein Light. Yeah, yeah. There was one light by once. Well, there was it a was, lot of cocktails. I know. So, okay. You shake so the now, glass. guys, I'm so, giving you guys enough preparation. I think there's something wrong with the ice cubes. They don't jingle properly. Oh, that's they why do. I'm saying <laughs> do have I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you guys, if you can't pop a top, then just tap the can. All right? Participate. All right. Light them up, boys. <laughs> See, that sounds fucking good. That sounded actually really nice. From an AMSR, ASMR standpoint, that was like, oh, yeah, that was like being there. I always jumped the gun. I've already lit mine. That was last week. I was, I said, was before I was like, to light, and James, John was, you know, and it was a good out, too. It was, it was well wasted. To my immediate left. And Kromke. To his immediate left. Brian Shaffron. Oh, Whoa. <gasps> nice. New and face. to his immediate left. Steve Sleepy. And to his left. Johnny Mack. Are we coming around the corner? Pete the Fireman. And Chris Smith, camera right, and behind the bar, Tom Pennington. Gonna put training wheels on tonight, yeah, Tom. Yeah, no kidding. All <laughs> right, <laughs> yay! And a safety helmet too. Mister, <laughs> Mister Black and I are not friends anymore. <laughs> Teslas are rusting. Cyber trucks are rusting. What did they say about uh, the Reservoir Dogs? <laughs> Uh, you don't get to pick your own names because then everybody wants to be Mr. Black. <laughs> How do you feel about Mr. Black? Ooh. Ooh. Tom does not want to be Mr. No, Black. No, no, no. So the... Uh, there was a lot of Mr. Speaking Pink of Reservoir Dogs, how do you feel about There was Mr. Pink in the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, there was a little Mr. Uh, Pink. We slipped and fell in Mr. Pink. I yeah. hosed it down with my precision urine stream. With Mr. Yellow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Speaking of uh, Reservoir Dogs and uh, Grumpy Sewer Guy, uh, how do you feel about tipping? Right. <laughs> uh, oh, no. That's a whole new threat. Oh, no. So the reason that we have a guest tonight, Brian Shaffron is here. I've known Brian for quite a long time. Yeah. Quite a long time. Like a really, really long time. Um, I think Ves I think we met over a small frame Vespa. Yeah, it's a, <clears throat> that was a really small, probably a 50 special. It was. Yeah. Yeah, it was that a 50 was special. And uh, Who was driving and who was on the back? <laughs> right. So, uh, so nut, nuts to butts? Mm. No, this is uh, yeah. Um, this is from a previous life. Yes. And uh, so, but that thing was cool. It was. It was. So the funny thing was, uh, the owner's dad came in, and the owner's dad uh, was going to Monday morning quarterback this entire build, mm. and like, and had all these demands about this Vespa Fifty <laughs> Special. Now I want to tell you guys, a Fifty Special is like walking, but you look more gay. OK, it's it gives you no job satisfaction whatsoever. And it is the bike that we used to say about, you know, there's nothing super about a Vespa Super and there's nothing special about a Vespa Special. Yeah. OK, the 50 Special was special by name alone and the skateboard helmet of the kid riding it. So the it was a little slow. Yep. And so when it showed up and How it apropos. came with a list of demands, but it were demands that were could not be completed. Like, for instance, a demand of this must have turn signals. Well, there was no part of this motorcycle that ever from the factory was ever designed to have turn signals. Mm -hmm. The wiring harness wasn't for turn signals. The stator wasn't for turn signals. And the battery that didn't exist wasn't for turn signals either. <laughs> okay? That was step one. Step two, it's got to be able to go 50. <laughs> Downhill. <laughs> Only <laughs> off a cliff. Yes. Right? Yeah. So that's it. Drop so when those two demands were given, I had a mechanic that worked for me at the time that went secondary battery in the glove box, rudimentary switch, four lights. The battery will be completely isolated from the charging system of the bike. It will be basically like the turn signal kit you'd put on your bicycle when you were a kid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Except your bicycle's faster. Also true. <laughs> in France, they had pedals. They did. Yeah. So they'd be moped compliant. But the whole 50 mile an hour thing. I said, I just want you to know that Vespa went out of their way to surgically engineer this bike so it could not accept any cylinder kit, any performance modification kit Whoa. that would make it go faster without cutting important parts of the frame out of it. Hmm, okay. So I had this very logical conversation because in this conversation, there were three people, the owner of the bike, a Vespa expert, and her father. And I said there was only one Vespa expert in this conversation. Who was that? 
Her father. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he, he's clearly. Actually, he's actually old man Piaggio. Uh, yeah. He knew a thing. Oh, dude. Only one. So he gave me no quarter. Because in his world, if I throw the right amount of money at it, you can make it do whatever I tell you to. And his right amount of money was about $1,000 less than what it actually would have cost to make the job work. Hmm. Okay. So now we have multiple problems, right? One of them being reality, a cash-based reality. Um, where I operate in cash-based reality. Mm -hmm. So he just, he operated within the realm of the customers. That's usually scooter, right. That scooter needed another scooter. It Correct. Did. It did. And, well, mm, so anyway. This reminds me like in the old days where they tried to turn lead into gold. Right. <laughs> Alchemist. <laughs> Alchemy. <laughs> so the long and short of it is, we made the turn signals work. We made some turn signals work. We made turn signals appear on the bike magically. And then we did uptune the motor mm -hmm. to the point where it would go. Yeah, it was really fun to ride. Really fucking fast. And it would go to that speed in very short intervals between gears, meaning that this thing was pure chainsaw madness. <laughs> that it had no <laughs> torque at all, but it had revs for fucking days. And how was it to ride that thing? Because it only weighed about 138 pounds. It was so small. It was so small. It blew small. my mind. It's so tiny. I can't believe you remember... All those details. This is my whole world. But you have that kind of shit that's happening to you every day, so I can't believe... Well, I don't remember their names, <clears throat> or their phone numbers, or important things, like yeah. where they live. Credit card number. You know... Well, that, you guys were, you guys were the, the presidents of fleet at the moment. That, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that uh, the father yeah. of the owner right. was the first person to ever be kicked out of Skidmark Garage. <laughs> wow. you, you, guys are drawing, you guys are drawing quite a picture. I, mean, oh, I, yeah. I think I have the triumph in question now, too. Yeah. Uh, oh. I do. The silver, the, yeah. uh, the aluminum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I own that bike Alumin now. I saw that in, under one of your yeah. racks, and I was like, oh, oh yeah, you didn't tank. Oh, yeah, because there can only familiar. be one of those. Yeah. Yeah, built by a drunk Indian person, dot, not feather. Uh, but this, this particular situation, so that little weird orange Vespa, before it left the shop, we were ripping around the neighborhood. And so I said, well, the problem with a two-stroke bike, any two-stroke bike, is if you're giving it to a person that isn't already been fucking fucked by two-strokes in their life, meaning that their left clutch hand is unusually strong and that their right kick and leg isn't unusually big, right? If you haven't had small displacement two-strokes and had to live with them, there are rules, and one of them re revolves around break-in. Uh, people talk about like, well, did you break your car in? Dude, it's a modern day car. Y y you don't break it in. Yeah, fuck you. Right? Oh, you, you got a brand new Harley Davidson. Did you break it in? Y you don't break that in. That's, that's not break it in. But if you have an old, leaning from the 70s, two-stroke, that now has twice as much CCs as it's supposed to, and four times as much horsepower as it's supposed to, break-in becomes church. It's a religion, which means you do five or six heat cycles and you retorque the head hmm. because shit stretches. Yep. Then you go through five or six heat cycles and you change the spark plug and you change the gearbox oil and you never, ever let the idle. I'm sorry. You never let the revs be what they call stationary. You never let it go because it will overheat. So you need to move the RPMs from oh to eh constantly. <laughs> Vary your speed like a maniac so it moves the heat all around the motor yeah. so that one little part of the motor doesn't get super duper crazy hot. And don't forget the heat shield. Don't forget the air box <laughs> heat shield, right? Yeah, there's an air, there's literally an air regulation device inside of Vespa that everyone's like, well, I don't need that. I'm only going to ride it for 10 I think minutes. it gets more air if I don't put it I on. I don't need the cowl on the cylinder. I yeah. don't need the air shroud yeah. that moves the air through it. Well, in any case, when she picked the bike up, I had written down a list of the things you must do and not do to make this bike last more than about a week. Because we have a lot of people that we give a bike to, and they're like, yeah, 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 whatever, snowmobiles, whatever, yeah, 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 chainsaws, whatever, whatever. Because I have a spiel. I have a, a script. Do's and don'ts. Right. So, but to credit, it didn't blow up. That I was aware of. It no. didn't come home. It no. didn't, it but somehow managed to not come home. That, uh, that list was also not shared with me. Well, I'm certain, oh, I'm absolutely certain <laughs> it wasn't. And Sometimes we write it in a Sharpie marker on the inside of the glove box. And then it was soon sold. Well, that's probably the best thing that could happen ever 
because it was really neat the way you like shifted by turning the twist grip shift. Yeah, that was neat. Yeah, twist grip shift is fucking. It's it's pretty cool. Um, there was a British motorcycle custom builder that in the Jesse James era of custom builders, West Coast Chopper Gen One custom builder guy, that every single chopper he built had a twist grip shifter. Oh, whoa. Yeah, every single one he built because he's an old Lambretta scooter boy. So that when he became famous in England for building custom choppers, every single bike he built had a twist grip shift. Wow. It's fucking cool. Yeah. It's pretty neat. That's I mean, it takes some ingenuity. Yeah. And, uh, and some billet and a good fucking machine. I mean, yeah. you at this point, you're not just going to grind that shit out. At this point, you probably need a bridge board. And you got to have little tiny gears that yeah. are. Yeah, it's super oh, cool. Well, I mean, if you wanted to just do it Hillbilly John style. Two you cables. Would just put like a two cables <laughs> to a little thing on your ship. A push me and a pull me. I mean, you yeah. wouldn't be able to index it first, right. neutral, like yeah. that. But you would be able to go up, yeah. you know, but click, 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 yeah. and then down, down, down. Yeah. Fairly easy. Have, pretty cool. Have we ever shown John the uh, the Cosa cable? No, no, that's that's one for the ages too. That's a one cable push me and pull me. Push, push pull, yeah. yeah. And that's yeah. not actually just that's not basically Cosa. a lawnmower. Cosa problem. didn't figure that out. Pretty much, that's actually Heinkel. Oh yeah. That. So Heinkel invented that first. Is it just a first. thick cable? It's just a thick a wire, a really thick wire. Yeah. If you get sick of your shifter cable stretching because they're the size of bicycle cables, yeah. Mm-hmm. Do the Cosa cable because that son bitch is like a horse's dick. It is not. You are not going to. Like, <laughs> Oh, you know, I, I have to I have to readjust these every once in a while because they stretch out. Mm-hmm. Not a coast cable. No, I thought you were talking about no. the taste. Oh no 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 yeah that, that's different. No no less salty. But yeah, be, yeah, he never less, he never tasted the cable. More like that candle. <laughs> yeah. That's it. So uh, so yay so that's that. Um, because are you, are you saying you went by feel? Not me. Okay. So because last week I didn't get to the hate mail. You guys all wanted hate mail. My computer didn't work. Awesome. And then we fucking went off into oblivion anyway, and it didn't matter. Yeah. Because we just proved we hate ourselves. Right. Fine. Hey, Phil and the gang, finally got some stuff in order and able to become a goddamn Patreon. Yeah. Met you at Vintage Days this year and wanted to say thanks for the ho- ho- horse brutality. Hospitality. <laughs> um, go ahead and make fun of me, but I am primarily a Harley guy. I laugh right along with you guys. Um, and uh, as you riff on Harley Davidson on the podcast. So... Here's one of the things that um, he says that I think is pretty interesting. He says, I have a sport sports you might like since I have it set up to be a bit sporty. <laughs> and uh, sale, but what he goes into is he says, I'm considering a brand new 2020 Moto Guzzi Eldorado that's been marked down a couple of grand. Yeah. So after listening to many of your old episodes, I've heard when you were a Gucci dealer and when you stopped. I've learned about how the $1,000 in dealer fees might not actually be the ripoff that he thought it was. No, that's, that's right. Um, though you've made fun of the uh, fact that Harley uh, dealers are everywhere. Good. Um, and you've also said how uh, Zero being in business for years with dealer support is important compared to the startup small electric bike companies. Yeah, it is. Having dealer support on high-tech beta testing shit is good. Uh, with that in mind, the Gucci dealer is nearly an hour and a half away from me. If I go for the Eldorado, how concerned should I be about reliability? How servicing it at a dealer that distance away from me? And uh, should I have a local mechanic work on it, or should I do it myself? Uh, here you go. I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, you have... Maintaining a Moto Guzzi Eldorado 2020 is not a particularly hard bike to maintain. Hmm. You will have to do more work than you think you have to to change the rear tire. Tom has done Correct. a Cali 1400. Correct. And that is a little more involved, but there are plenty of YouTubes that can get you through it. That part is special. You should only be doing that probably every ten to 14,000 miles unless you're Johnny Thunder. Um, you'll be fine. Now... The one thing that you will want to do is you can go online and you can get an actual service code for your bike. And I, I could go on it right now. I could tell you what it is. If you just Google Moto Guzzi service code, California 1400, there'll be a five-digit code. That's a code that your bike will ask you for to turn off the service light, the service needed light, every time you've done an oil change. So it'll make that little wrench go away. And it's a five-digit number, and I cannot tell you what it used to be. I mean, I used to have it memorized for the Gritzos and all that different stuff. But, yeah, so you'll be able to punch that into your bike via the dashboard to make the service light go away after you've been a good owner and done your oil service and stuff like that. So you don't have to see that thing. And the little, you know, service warning will come up every time you start the motorcycle. That's really it. The rest of it, as far as being a hard motorcycle to own, it's not a hard motorcycle. Yeah, the valves are just sitting there. 
You don't even have to remove a re- tank or anything? Yeah. Or? It's, hey, man. The uh, Ducati dealer said I need to do a valve adjustment on my uh, V4. Oh, good luck, uh-huh. pal. Yeah. Bring your wallet. Um, a Moto Guzzi valve adjustment, you can do that watching a YouTube video. Yeah. And you don't need special tools. Because yeah. they're not, they, they went away from hydraulic valves or hydraulic uh, lifters. Tom, right? hydraulic valves and lifters were only on Moto Guzzi's until they figured out what a curse it was. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking one year. That's, well, it's yeah. the, Is that the, the Stelvio yeah. thing? The, no, it was no. the stone and the aluminum. What well, was with the roller um, factors? That's different. That's different. different. And that doesn't apply to this motor. No. We're not going to go down that rabbit hole. That's, right, right, if, right. You're, that's if, if you're an 8 the, valve 12, if you're an 8 valve 1200 owner, you already know that problem. Yeah, right, yeah. right, yeah. It's Somebody's already problem. told you. Yeah, yeah. The first time you went into a Moto Guzzi meeting or a group or whatever it was, somebody went up to you and went, you got a Moto Guzzi 1200 8 valve? Your motor's going to explode it's and blow your tits off. And you're like, no, that's not what's going to happen at all. Oh, it's, my God, a Chintaro. <laughs> it's a diamond-like coating failure that was present on many Chevrolets in America that you dealt with, that, that you figured it out. Nothing could blow my tits off. Mm, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> fair enough. All right. Good yeah, they're enough. they're fair. Uh, I mean, th- it's yeah. basically <laughs> just like servicing the old the old Eldorado. It's three bolts and go. Steve's up so, for the challenge. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you remember a couple of weeks ago when I was saying if any of you assholes has figured out how to sell a motorcycle online without using Facebook Marketplace? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Yes. Or Cycle Trader? Yes. Uh-oh. That I want to know about it. Uh-oh. Yes. Uh, Randy Martin says he's been doing uh, cars and bids. Doug DeMuro's uh, oh. thing. And I, I hadn't even thought about that. Do they so have motorcycles on it? It's like bring a trailer for people with less money than bring a trailer. Yeah. Because bring a, bring a trailer just got real fucking pinky in the air. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, we were so, looking at bring a trailer today and you know he's like, oh, look, it's only $1,900. Yeah, but there's three days left. I'm yep. like, it's kind of popular. People are spending kind of stupid money there. It's pretty fierce, man. It's pretty fucking fierce. Yeah. The uh, Okay. I cool. wonder if they're made for bring a trailer bikes too. Oh, oh I assume. Oh man! I actually actually bodged a uh, slash two back together one time for a guy who was intentionally going to sell it on uh, on bring a trailer. Bring a trailer. Right. And then he realized after I got it running for him and literally bodged it back together. I'm not lying. Mm-hmm. Um, he started riding and he said, "Well, this is the nicest this bike has ever ridden. I really I'm want to keep, to keep it." And you're and like, I went, no, 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 no. You're the one who told me to fucking rat fuck it. <laughs> you're the guy who no. told me just get it out the door. Oh, so I did. <laughs> We like, can we can put the time machine back exactly, and you can spend exactly. real money. We literally we yeah. literally like I told first thing I told him I said you need a set of CJ carburetors like buy the Chinese carburetors put it on here no no I need to have the original carburetors dude I can't fix them they have holes uh, okay here we go <laughs> gentlemen I finally got around to catching up with the podcast after a long eventful roller coaster of a holiday season this is from Ryan Hegdahl. Which yeah. means he's probably a Viking. I recognize that. I think you yeah, do. Too. I think we, uh, I, yeah, that sounds, uh, actually probably. sounds very to me. Uh, you might remember he was the MT guy. So he had the MT. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So guy. he's Elsinore Armaliga. Like he's the guy who wanted to use the gas gas parts on his Elsinore. Yeah. Right. And build like a mutant had my Elsinore. Head, scratching my head on that one. Yeah. Well, I think we all were. Right. So, yeah. Anyway, um, you ain't going past tech for vintage class yeah. if it's not a vintage motorcycle. Right. They're funny about that. Yep. <laughs> super funny about it. They want to see like bean oil in the fucking two stroke. Like right. they're they're picky. OK. Anyway. <laughs> The week of Thanksgiving, I was informed the machine shop I was working at would be closing oh, dude. permanently. Uh-oh. I instantly started searching for a new job and was able to come up with one that would allow me to start that following Monday. Well done. There, yep. is, a, there is a fucking shortage there of machinists out <laughs> Absolutely. If you're in the trades, my friend, you will never go hungry. And that walking into not having a job and you didn't do anything wrong, that sucks. I've been uh, and <laughs> we're going to be talking about that with Brian later about certain skills. Pay the bills. Oh, yeah. Yep. Right? Bro, did you get fired, Brian? Yes, he's looking for a job in the trades. Oh. <laughs> I fired myself. <laughs> there's ca- so. There's a couple lifts open. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now he works at an engine machine shop that specializes in dirt stock car engines. Cool. Oh, well Very done. nice. Oh. Uh. oh, that sounds fucking this is fun. <laughs> Honestly. Oh, tell me more. Oh, yeah? <laughs> right. So, as you might guess, this is a dream job. And now I have access to do all the machine work on my CB750. Oh, yeah. The bike that we told him, yes, yeah. Yeah. you should. On another bright side, I came across a 1971 BSA A65 Lightning that the owner gave to me with only one request. And I did say gave to him with only one request. Take care of her. The bike is in rough shape, but I'm looking forward to it being a great addition to the fleet. Oh, yeah. I also ended up buying a 2000 Kawasaki KX250 
And February 3rd was the first race, Endurocross, on the new to me bike, and we took first place. Well done. Excellent. Yeehaw. Nice. You should go get her, this Ryan. No Fuck kidding. yeah. I like we told you we liked this guy. Yep. yep. Right? And we told you the first time we read his letter how much we liked him, and now we like it. I can't okay. believe he's 70, though. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, hey, hey. Hey, he's a Patreon at the $20 level. So he got the Cut joke. Cut him some slack. <laughs> he got the joke, too. Yeah. Rant time. I was listening to the podcast where you were discussing the most reliable vehicles. And I want to put my two cents in. I would argue that the most reliable and longest lasting vehicles were made by Chevrolet from 1973 to 1987. 91 in some body packages. Mr. Smith may have some opinions on this. Uh, so... Yes, gentlemen, the square body Chevy GMC. Many of these trucks are still used as work trucks to this day. And though missing most of their panels due to rust, they're still kicking. Hmm. Powered mostly by the near unkillable small block Chevy, these trucks will almost always get you from point A to point B without a lot of fuss, as long as it has at least two quarts of oil in the pan. Can Peru, he says, I accidentally tested this on my 56-mile one-way commute. Um, I may just be a young buck, but I've been around a lot of vehicles, foreign and domestic. But my 84 Chevy pickup, Moose, is the only one that has never left me stranded. No matter how hurt, he always finds a way to limp us home. Anyway, enough for me. Thanks again for putting on such a great show. And it was great hearing Grumpy's tale. And I'm really glad he's back with us and recovering. Take care and keep on rocking. So, my brothers... Go ahead. I'm not sure what Yeah, year. great letter, by the way. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. My brothers, I'm not sure what year of square body it was, but it was a two-tone silver and blue, uh, long bed, four-wheel drive. He had 350,000 miles on that with the original engine. Mm -hmm. Had to replace the rear end one time. Towards the end of its life, it was his mud, his backup mud bog. Yeah. yeah. Hit two, 300 mud bogs, full chat, just blah. Like, it became known as the Chevy that wouldn't die. Yep. And then he sold it for fifteen hundred bucks to a guy who continued to drive it back on the road. Yeah. As far as I know, it's still alive. Like Whoa. sick. I mean, he's he's right about the Chevy three hundred five because they put him in the Caprice and they used him as New York taxi cabs forever. Ever. And I've had and I've owned new shortage of three fifties. Yeah. With a TH three fifty behind it. Yeah. Couldn't yeah, I mean, that it, shit. It I mean, that's, that's the I think thing about is, my like my RV. It has four or five eighty rear end <laughs> and I, I've had it. so it's like 583s in the rear <laughs> and i'm driving at 75 miles yeah. like, <laughs> <laughs> like and it has sixty thousand miles like yeah that. right yeah i mean that's you know that's that's chris was in chris the the cars that you were involved with when you were at general motors they were the smaller variety though yeah, they're the, the X cars. Yeah, the sh citations. Were oh, those yeah. All? The yeah. Citations? yeah, the citations. Yeah, one across all four of the uh, the major. Maybe not such a great reliability record. Uh, people love to take them and put them in their glove compartment in case they needed something. In case they needed something else to get home on. Yeah. The uh, Citation <laughs> two door was one of those ones that yeah. was like, yeah. really, you guys are working real hard to be Japanese now. Mm. So hard. Um, so but all black Chevy definitely has the potential. As long as you don't let anything catastrophic happen to it. Like you, a water pump goes bad, mm -hmm. replace yeah. your water pump. If something goes bad, all, all, with all the, you know, everything on the outside and of the motor, the inside of the motor will last. Let me tell you about time. a certain particular GM powered vehicle that has logged more miles than we can even calculate. Black Betty. No, no, Ramalam. The, uh, <laughs> the United States Postal Long Life Vehicle. Oh, yeah. In unknowable number that's of miles the, that's because the little grumman. our grumman like uh, the the grumman mail cat uh that little vehicle our postal carrier that we had at the shop said uh that he has never seen one with a working speedometer or odometer in over 20 years of service he's never seen he has no conceivable idea of how many miles he's put on how many different of them and they also were engineered to last for a certain number of years in a competition set up by our federal government, and that they exceeded that by like 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> so they're now picking them up and taking them away. And, uh, you know, that's an S10 engine. Yeah. Whoa. So that's an S10 drivetrain. That, that's that probably going to be what, a uh, Iron Duke? It is an Iron Duke. Yeah. Yep. And the Iron Duke, honestly, because that and the Quad 4 are pretty mm -hmm. much... Yeah, they're. I'd say they're probably right there with the three hundred five. It's very. You can't kill if, them. If you guys do any, if you watch them. any documentaries about the 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 Grumman yeah. long life vehicle, it's a 
like it's a comedy of errors on a truly government <laughs> level. But what they ended up with was something that really was kind of it, fucking unkillable. It's the cockroach of uh, cockroach of minivans. Well, his brother has a mail carrier vehicle, but it's it, not a Grumman. Is no, it? it's not. It's not a Grumman. It's on a Jeep base. Yeah, it's got a. Uh, Chevy six cylinder grafted into it now, but that didn't come. No, it didn't originally. come with that, did it? And I don't know who made the body. I don't remember. No. But it looked like it looks to me like it's an, also an aluminum body of some sorts. I think it's sheet metal. I don't oh, think is it's it? Aluminum. <laughs> so is it like the in between with between the DJ five and the? I'll LLB? tell you what. Yeah. It's the exact same vehicle that they used in the Borat movie when they had like the ice cream truck. Oh yeah, really? Yeah, with, the, with the bear in it. Yeah, it's, that's, that's what it the is. Same vehicle. Uh, yeah. Chicken yeah. hell. Okay. Well, that's. I mean, that's cool, and I. Again, which we drove that thing all the way back from uh, St. Louis that when he when he got it, which was really kind that of, had to be fucking miserable. It was, and it had the same gearing as uh, well. And it had like a little four vans. banger in it too, like no, it had the six cylinder at that. Oh, time. somebody had already done the engine. Prior to that, it had a four fifty four in it. The oh, guy God. that built it. What the fuck? It was dangerous with the six cylinder in it. I can't imagine what it was like with the V eight in it. Wow! But it Boy, was also is, yeah. super low geared, just like Johnny's. Uh, <laughs> Motorhome, <laughs> yeah. which my brother eventually uh, changed the rear end on it. Okay, that's that's fierce. Uh, well, okay, so that's it. So the reason we got Brian here today is <clears throat> MotoGo. Um, MotoGo is having their annual MotoGo party, and we always go. Sixth annual. And sixth annual. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Right. And uh, if you listen to our podcast, or if you listen to the Motorcycles and Misfits podcast. We have been talking about the concept of motorcycle co-ops for over 12 years. Over 12 years. There's been this idea, that idea, everything in the world. But the only person I know to have ever done it successfully is him. (laughs) Because what Lies is doing with motorcycles and misfits is less of a co-op, more of a club. Yeah. You know, they do bring in the odd straggler every now and then, but usually they... Usually the straggler escapes. All, yeah, or while they're down there trying to find the dildo that she put on their bike, they get knighted, and they're they're now misfits forever, right? Like it's like it's like the old Roach Motel. They check in, but they don't chuck out, right? And and they're everything they do is free. That's a big deal, yeah. And that is, it's not membership based. Yeah, she's all about doing it for and free. And they do the not spirit of it. Yeah, they've never cracked the code of like workstations. Where I mean, fuck that, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Phil, I'm only, Phil, I'm only barely just cutting that whole workstation idea. <laughs> Tom's working on it. We're gonna get in there. And in fact, we, we may make him. We may make him just go stand in one of your workstations for just just give him a, just give him a beer. Yeah. Make him stand in your workstation and just drink it in. Yep. But, and he's not allowed to touch anything. Yep. Nothing in this life is free. You better get tough but, or die. But I also <laughs> think that there's a huge distinction and difference between, and as much as I love the Misfits and Liza and everybody, but they have a tent with some tools. Yeah. And, and he has like bridge ports and people. Oh, that and well, it, it, and we're going to get into that. Yeah, yeah. Hang you on. Know, it's a whole because, different thing. Because to understand where Moto Go is, yeah. You have to first understand what skid mark is. Right, right. Because Moto Go couldn't happen without a clean, well lit place. Right. So you have to have a clean, well lit place. And if you're trying to herd the cats and there's four, <laughs> spoken by a man who knows, had four mechanics going at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> if you're trying to run four mechanics, in four workstations at the same time, you will have a board by your desk that you hit your head on several times a day, okay? <laughs> and you will become very familiar with the phrase, where's that fucking dot, 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 <laughs> okay? And I say, I always answer that with, I've bought 17 of those fucking dot, dot, dots, Dude. and I had them in my b- box secret box, whatever, and I have a dot, dot, dot hanging in every workstation, and if there's no fucking dot, 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 then you owe me a fucking dot, 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 (laughs) okay? Because I'm a realist, and remember that money thing I told you about earlier? Yeah. Okay. So, that's chaos. Four. How many members you got, right, Brian? At the moment? Sure, uh, right now, be good. I would say 35. Okay, now we understand. 35 cats. Yeah, fuck. How many, and how how many, many workstations how many, do you yeah, have? 20. Ah! 
How many 10 millimeter sockets do you go through a year? Uh, you know, they don't disappear forever. <laughs> so, they, they do get... <laughs> They just slip into an alternative reality. Yeah, <laughs> then, and, then you know, migrate. Enough people. Uh, how enough, did how did this get here? Enough, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> enough people come in with uh, cardboard boxes full of their grandfather's tools and mm. donate. Nice. Right, good. And that happens like once a month. So I never run out of the ten millimeter. I when I go through and I start restocking everybody's bays because things just don't get put back. The tens are missing, and I've always got enough tens to restock every single one of them. And then, really? Yep. And then once or twice a year, we have a massive cleanup, and we yeah. find twenty or thirty tens laying around underneath <laughs> the benches, <laughs> in boxes, yeah. in bins, mm-hmm. still on bikes. <laughs> <laughs> still but on it's bikes. it's amazing. <laughs> it is truly amazing. I the uh, the layout that you're using. So describe for the folks at home, and I'm going to pull up a picture for the so we can, so the guys can see it of what your what your uh, what your operations look like. Um, so right now that's casting out to the people at home so they can see it, and then I'm going to pull up uh, the same thing for us to be able to see it. The uh, describe what the the workstations look like. So it's a pegboard instead of a, a chest of drawers, right? And uh, I had a good friend named Shell. She got good and high one night, and she designed the pegboard for me at my first location over in the uh, Clark Fulton neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I was like, just go to town, make something cool. And she designed this really cool thing, and she had all the standards on the left, all the metric on the right. She had a really cool way to hang the the extensions, and we had a screwdriver holder in the middle, and we had all the brushes and weird shit hanging on each one, a little bit of art on them, and... It was really cool looking. And over time, it became more boring and just, you know, more functional. More functional? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a great picture of those kids. That was, it is a great picture. Yeah. The, uh, that's a pretty good example of what a bench looks like. That's They're, what I thought. Some I, of them are 10 feet long. Most of them are eight. I thought 10 was a necessary thing when I first opened, so I built the first, like, eight of them at 10 feet long. Mm-hmm. I remember. Stupid. They're really big. They're huge. Fucking huge. But now they're all eight. And every single, all 20 of them have the same wrenches, the same sockets, hanging in roughly the same place so that mm-hmm. if you end up switching your spot, you know where things are. And what I think is a critical element to these things, if you look underneath the bench, so there's this area, and that's what's lacking in most people are like, I'm going to put a lift in my house. I'm going to build a thing I can roll motorcycles up on and work on them. Keep in mind, you will be taking parts off this motorcycle. If you put a gas tank on top of your washing machine, it will fall off. Mm-hmm. If you put a headlight on top of your whatever, it will fall off. Put your shit as low to the fucking ground as you possibly can, and totes are the godsend. Yep. Yeah. Totes are life's answer to everything. Totes should be free because... The more totes you have, the more organized the world is. I mean, it's seven bucks a pop. They're getting pretty cheap. And worse than that. Uh, They're not seven bucks a pop right now, I mind you. Uh, They're about nine or ten bucks a pop right now. You can only get the the seven buck ones if you go to Home Depot. And they're like, all the Merlot ones are six bucks a pop. Like, it's a particular color, right? But I will say, like, if you don't use bent or something like that, and, like, you know, you just put your tank just away from the bike while you're working Mm -hmm. on it, I guarantee you when you drop that 10 millimeter, it's going to hit the ground. Yep. Gain about seventy four thousand miles of velocity, <laughs> and then hit the gas tank oh, in yeah. the tiny corner where you can't push it out yep. every single fucking time. But if you look at that picture, yeah, in the top yeah. left corner, you can see a gas tank. I can see a gas tank, a Triumph gas tank, hanging scarily so, on the corner. So one of the members, PJ, yeah, who was building bikes like mad for the for a couple of years there, mm-hmm. every time he would get a gas tank, mm-hmm. he would hang it on the top of the pegboard. Sure. And I was like, dude, what the fuck? That's going to that fucking fail. scaring the fuck out of me. And he <laughs> goes, nothing can fall on it. That's true. I'm not going to drop a 10 mil on right. it. Yeah. I'm not nothing can fall on it. On it. He He's goes, absolutely right. And really, and he'd shake the whole pegboard yeah. and it wouldn't come off. He's like, this is actually the safest Because all the gas tanks are U-shaped. Yes, they're 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 a saddle. channel yeah. in there yeah. and it just fits perfectly. And I, That's brilliant. So now we hang tons of them on top I of know, it. Yeah, last time I was there, last time I was there, it's pretty much... All gas tanks yeah. across the top. And it looks and, cool. And that's brilliant, and it looks awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when people come to your motorcycle co-op, do they come back to the same workbench? 
Mostly yes, but my original intent was that when they leave for the day, they would take their bike off the lift, they'd push it over to temporary storage. When they came back a week later, they would just push it up to another spot. For the most part, everybody leaves their bike up, <laughs> even if they disappear for six months. <laughs> oh, at a fucking time. no way. It stays <gasps> up. So most, most people are coming back to the same exact spot. Oh. And it didn't really matter a whole lot when I when business was slow, but now right. that it's picking up, yeah. I, I can't. Oh, oh man, it that is happen. terrifying to me. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's something. Like <sighs> uh the places where I started working, I had a manager, I had a, a service department manager that when it would be a half an hour left in your shift or half an hour left in your time, uh in, when you were new. Not he wouldn't babysit you this way if you've been there for a while. But when you're new, he'd come out and he'd be like, "Hey, hey, I know you're, I know you're deep into it, but we close in a half an hour, and that lift had better be clean." <laughs> Brian's thinking, "No, I was like, oh, okay." And I'm like, <laughs> and as a, as a young mechanic, I was like, "Okay, lift's gonna be clean." And so you know, we didn't have giant static snap on tool chests mm-hmm. in each workstation because we had to move around. Mm-hmm. We had, you know, the, you're not working on the same bike all day long, right? You're moving around. So we had to have rolly carts, but all of our shit had to be on a rolly cart and all our rolly carts had to be locked up. So that was just it. And at the end of the work day, if you didn't have your rolly cart locked up and your rolly cart wasn't where it was supposed to be, or you left some shit open on somebody else's, you know, in somebody else's community workstation, you weren't going to work there very long. The other people that worked with you were going to make your life a fucking living hell in a lot of really interesting ways. Yeah. So, you know, you couldn't find your quarter drive ratchet. You know, that kind of shit. Like, guys were, guys were malicious. So if they found somebody that wasn't a clean, a clean operator, they'd break you the habit real fast. Wow. So it was really vicious. But, like, that whole thing about having shared community space, like, shared community space can be really daunting. Oh, it can... Yeah, there's... There's a lot of um, you think about think about your own personal garage when you're working on your shit in your yeah. in your house in your garage when you're done for the night and yeah. you go in I would say 99 out of 100 of us, of us don't put our tools back because we know we're going to be back there the next day exactly and we right. leave it right where we want it right and it doesn't matter because right. no one else is sharing that space That's exactly right. I've always encouraged all the members to treat the garage as if it was their own treat mm-hmm. the tools like they're their own. Treat the whole place like they own it, and that has that's the wrong idea. Yes. You need to tra- <laughs> <laughs> put your shit away. Backfired because people don't put anything away. Oh yeah, and yep. it it drove me really, it really uh, didn't sit well with the little bit of OCD tendencies I have, and I'd spend a couple hours every single day at like two a.m. putting all the tools back yeah. on every single pegboard, yeah. and and swearing under my breath and just getting super angry. And after a couple of years, I was like, this is not, I didn't start this so that I could be angry every night at midnight <laughs> cleaning up everybody's <laughs> shit. So then I was like, oh, fuck it. Let them clean up their own shit. And if they can't find it, it's right. on them. Yeah. So very rarely, sometimes I just get a wild bug up my ass. I'm like, cool, I'm just going to get OCD for a minute and I'm going to go hang everything I can and I enjoy it. I love, look, there's a thing about men that until men turn 40 years old, they're the most disorganized, out of control, fucking wild, bah! you know, just shits everywhere. Like, you don't even want to see what my room looked like when I was a teenager. Yeah. And then I went to the army where I had no choice in the matter. I had to roll my socks and underwear to a very specific size, and Pete knows exactly how big they are supposed to be. Because he, he, he had to roll his socks too. I did. And you, he rolled his fucking underwear too, because we all did it, right? And they came in and busted our balls about it constantly. And you become that kind of a different, differently organized person. And if you didn't have OCD before, you, you might have it now. Mm. And uh, having to paint your tools quarterly, you know, having to do all these horrible things. Having to paint a grease gun. Right, painting a grease gun. <laughs> That's a brilliant example. <laughs> Best I'm example. I'm trying to ever. figure out why half my tools are all yellow. <laughs> uh, I don't know why that is. 
It's all right. I have what? the I, I, yellow spray paint. I have the entire Skittles and rainbow. And there's blue ones too. The entire Skittles there rainbow is, like in the back of the shop. Blue. There's a turquoise blue one too because we had two different mechanics at two different times that couldn't keep their dick beaters <laughs> off my fucking tools. So well, I opened tools are painted. So I yeah. So I j- opened up the drawer to my tool chest in a fit of fucking rage. Grabbed the closest can of spray paint I could find, which happened to be safety yellow, and just sprayed the inside of my own tool chest. Nice. Do you know how mad you got to be to spray I the say, inside yeah, of your you own tool chest? Superman. You showed them. Superman. <laughs> it's so now John has a half a dozen. <laughs> Wow. Yellow tools. It is It is Skittles rainbow in the back of the shop. And they're the two colors that he has on his MotoGo shirt right now, too. Oh, yeah. Because the one is uh, engine Ford engine block turquoise, yep. and the other one is safety yellow. Yep. Because the other mechanic we had later that had a habit of helping himself to my tool chest, because I usually hire these guys, and I'm like, look, I like to think that we all can work together here. Don't make me put a lock on my toolbox. I have, I have specialized tools. If you need a specialized tool, please go get it from my toolbox so that I'm not requiring you all to have. Because if you've ever worked in a real motorcycle shop, they require you to have all the specialized tools. Well, well the interesting thing is that the way my tools got painted was somehow they were in your toolbox. I am absolutely <laughs> 100% certain. That, I had a couple that I was like, yeah. hey, that's mine, and he painted it. Yeah, and... And John, I'm going to bet you $1,000 that I went back there and flew off the fucking handle and said, I want every one of my tools back in my toolbox or you're all fired. When and w- I started when I came you- back, the tools that were my tool bus got s- unceremoniously painted. When I started with you, I went to Harbor Freight and loaded up on, a, <laughs> on the best Taiwanese sockets that I could find. And it was pretty decent for yeah. what I paid for it. And yeah. it actually stood the test of time. And I can tell you, when I left there, yeah. I, uh, first of all, I got rid of my crafts and stuff and brought it home quick. Yeah. Swapped it out because I could see what was going on. <laughs> <laughs> Shit was getting painted. Yeah. <laughs> that was, hey, that was late. <laughs> but then well I, before shit got painted. Well, when I left, yeah. I have every I had every piece of that tool kit, yeah. including the 10 millimeters and everything right. like that. Yeah. So yeah. I managed to do it. And yeah. I, it was not easy. But. No, it's not. And that's the hard thing. People don't realize when you're working in an environment where there's other people around. It is not taken for granted that when you leave that carburetor apart on that workbench. Yeah. You know what I hate are the fucking socket rails. Those are that's a good way to fuck your shit up. I left it. I tore. I cut the lid off immediately and set yeah. it in my toolbox. Yeah. Everything had a place. Right. Yep. And if a socket wasn't in there, it was like a missing tooth. Yeah. It was immediate apparent. I'm missing my 13 millimeter socket. Where the fuck is that? My old boss. If you were home, at home where you lived. <laughs> and a, a wrench was missing from where the wrench was supposed to be. Guess who was calling you? Holy shit. Dun, dun, dun. Because the next crew can't work. <laughs> so we ran two oh, shifts at my place. Oh. So. Hey! Hey! Here. Yay! <laughs> we got a grumpy sewer guy in the house. <laughs> <laughs> Yeehaw! I can share pictures of the if you want. Holy shit. The, uh, but yeah, I, got, I got a phone call one time. And I had to drive all the way to Broadway, and I was living in Willoughby, and I had down to drive to Broadway, Krieger, you know, Suzuki dealership. And so I showed up, and I was like, this had better be good. This had better be super, super good. And I was using a gear puller, a harmonic, you know, puller, and we had a wall of specialized tools, and I was using that tool. And Jesus Christ, people throwing cans. And I was the last person to touch that fucking tool. I think. You know what? Come back there. I, mean, I came back and I found that tool in somebody else's workstation. Ooh. And uh, yeah, put him on the mic. Of I'm shame. pretty exactly. sure that that was not me leaving that tool somewhere else. I think that was another mechanic fucking me over for maybe not exercising some good lift discipline or something. But I assure you that when you get four or five trades mechanics working together and everybody's fighting for that billable hour. And if you got to spend 15 minutes looking for the 10 millimeter socket, yeah, that's a quarter of an hour of money you didn't make. Yeah, so you could that that could cost you 30 bucks going to look for a 10 millimeter. Uh, and these other mechanics were all too happy to let you know that if you're slowing them down, they're only going to get four hours bill billable, billable that day, instead of the eight that they need to feed their family on. Because most places, when you're working, book rate. Yeah, if the job says it's three hours and you know it takes seven, you still got to do it in three hours because yeah. you're going to get paid for three hours. Yeah. 
And it's terrifying. So you being able to manage 20 plus lifts or cubbies, we call them cubbies, yeah. uh, workstations, that's fucking amazing. I mean, that really is. That's no shit. That's real stuff. Well, thank you. And, uh, and I so, tell you what, the guy leaves his bike there for six months and doesn't touch it. Uh, his billable hours are going to be way down. His billable hours. <laughs> Man, I, I do not know what you're charging for membership, but <laughs> if that guy left his bike... If, if, if he walked away from a lift and left the lift that way for, like, more than an day, yeah. I'm up his ass side. Right. Yeah. In my garage, I walked away from the lift for, like, four years now. <laughs> yeah, hey. how many people were sharing that lift? Nobody. Just John. Yeah. Right. When, yeah. When Chris Smith and I were driving out, out west a couple years ago, and he had a little problem with his uh, Moto exhaust. Guzzi, we stopped it. Yeah, the exhaust yeah. broke. And we go to this uh, shop where it didn't look like a lot of stuff was moving through the shop. And the guy said, uh, well, I can take that exhaust off, if I, but uh, I got a bike on the lift right now, and I can weld it up for you. And uh, we go in there, and there's like two inches of dust on top of this bike that's sitting on the lift. Oh, the one bike on the one lift? Yeah. Been there for at least told, one year? I told Chris, do not let this man take your motorcycle <laughs> apart. <laughs> you, you will be here for a very long time. He was a taker or parter, <laughs> yeah. not a putter together. <laughs> That was somewhere. I bet in, you Brian's run into a couple of those. Yeah. Nebraska, or the Dakotas, or something yeah, up there. We South were we Dakota, were way out in the middle yeah. of somewhere, man. So the, I mean, I know in my thing when I was kind of brought up, we used to tease that meth was a powerful drug because it would make people take apart motorcycles and not put them back together again. Hmm. Uh, and then you'd go to the person's house and realize their TV was taken apart, their toaster was taken apart, their Game Boy was taken apart. Everything was taken apart, and you're like, "How did the cat survive?" Right? That's what you know. What it's so like, Illyria and all these places have yeah. like meth problems. Yeah, I'm like, man, just get one of those like computer recyclers where they have to take the little gold like pieces in India. off the right. fucking. You chip. just take apart hard drives just for the get rest a of your bunch life. Of meth heads, they'd be like, "What a perfect job! Our best job ever <laughs> for was, them." Yeah. There was an interview with uh, my my favorite guitar guy, right? And he was talking about growing up in this park, and now it's all meth out there, right? Mm -hmm. But then a rumor got out that there was gold in the creek. He said you'd go no there, and he said way. there was like a hundred meth heads just to. He goes, what a, for perfect, gold? "What a perfect job!" And that is perfect. Looking through sand to find gold. <laughs> that is literally sorting sand. <laughs> <laughs> they they finally found, found something that works. Yeah, it, it literally <laughs> corresponds to their high, and, it's, and it never runs out. No, it's <laughs> literally a river. So messed up. <laughs> that is fucking amazing. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, so, how did Skidmark? become the traveling road show that MotoGo was. Uh, Tell us. What do you mean? Well, so I wasn't the first the wasn't the first version of MotoGo something of a, a traveling operation? Uh, the first version of MotoGo the original idea absolutely mm -hmm. was mobile shop class and I was going to have this big trailer yeah. and I was going to have the tool benches and the bike set up and we were going to drive from school to school, yeah. and the kids would come in for an hour. And we were assuming that none of the schools had space, so we'd pull into the parking lot. The kids would come in into this big ass trailer, and right. they'd work on the bikes, and then they'd put the tools back, which my my second biggest assumption. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, then, and then we'd drive that to the next school, and right. those kids would pick up where the first kids left off. And right. so it also meant that the kids would have to document what they were doing. Oh, they so have to that log the their hours. Next kids could say, oh, they took the the spinny oil filter off and they did this. And so the next step is we got to do this. And so it would... And so for the listeners at home, this was all based on the Honda CB350. Yes, 100%. One product, one item. We talked about this, about this ages ago. Yeah. What is the most common? And also in our podcast 12 years ago, we said, what is the one bike everyone should know how to work on? Yeah. Long before he hatched Moto Go. We were well at, we were well into the, like if you ever want to be a motorcycle mechanic get a CB350 and just dive in. Yeah. And how cool is it that that's the bike that you decided? Yeah, and it's the only bike I've I mean, I know a little bit about a CB750 but the CB350 was what I really felt comfortable with. Right, cuz I when I met you, you had your hood under a Hot Rod Ford. Uh I think you were with some sort of a Mustang at the moment. No, no, no you guys were on a Vespa 50. We've already had no, your story. No, 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 no. I, I, <laughs> I went to a soccer sportsplex car show thing, and I found him rubbing elbows with the uh, satin jacket crowd. 
yeah. fucking high. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you. I thought you had some kind of. A, I thought you had some kind of a street ride. Set I think no, that was John I've with his never. Corvette. Oh, I thought you did. No. Yeah, might have just been. <laughs> might have just been the same environment. I thought you. I've seen you. I might have saw the haircut and thought that you were one of those guys. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. surprised yeah. you're not wearing your jean shirts, shorts, and white <laughs> shoes right now. Oh, <laughs> is New Balance? <laughs> no. Uh, yeah. So the CB350. Yeah. And and I thought that that's how we'd do it. We'd have two or three of these trucks, and we would just be hitting all the schools all the time, and yeah. we talked to people about our idea. And they were like, that's fucking insane. There's no way that that's going to work. A, you're going to have to be pulling around a 55-foot semi-trailer. Yeah. And you're going to have to have yeah. a CDL to do it. And you're yeah. not going to get that in the parking lot. And they kind of talked us out of it to an extent. We did try it once, kind of. And then we realized we just need to bring... The motorcycles to the school and make them find a spot and we can leave them there instead much of better packing them up and bringing them every much time. better now do you leave one workshop set up there uh it mostly depends on the school but uh -huh. usually we bring if they're doing a whole motorcycle there's one full pegboard mm -hmm. set up per bike and most schools have at least three bikes oh that's amazing yeah and we usually have three to four kids per bike yeah uh, like Magnificat High School, all girls. They have four setups, four bikes, 16 girls, three to four times a week. Uh, and it's it's spectacular. That's amazing. Now, 16 last girls, year... 16 32. Um, last year when I was looking at your setup upstairs, because mm -hmm. now we now you've got Moto Go right upstairs to Skidmark, yeah. thanks to your new building. Uh, I, it looked like you were doing like a round robin. Like you had like a... Like, you were moving people around to different phases of an operation because it, it looked like you had a whiteboard or even a calendar set up for each team and what, you know, kind of what their progression was. Uh, yeah. And that's actually, that whiteboard setup was more like what coaches, because we call them coaches, because right. all kids have a better relationship with a coach than a teacher. For well, of course. Part. Yeah. So what coaches are going to what schools, what days of the week, what kind of program they're running. Okay. Cause some schools we bring in, just the 350 engine on a cart with a toolbox. All right. So I'm glad you brought that up. And so we'll go to a school with eight engines with on eight carts with eight toolboxes, and we get two kids per cart. And when the kids are done for the day, we can tuck them all away into a closet somewhere. And then we show up next week. We pull them out. We do the same thing over again and re, you know, continue. Tell the people how you started with the visible V8s. So after COVID hit and we couldn't be in the schools anymore, I was... Molly and I, my wife, who's the executive director of MotoGo, was like, we got to be able to do something virtually. And I was rooting around in the basement, and I found this CB750 engine model. It was like the... It wasn't the bike. It was just the engine. No, it was just it was a, kind of... Tamaya, a, fucking beautiful, yeah. gorgeous CB750 model. The, oh, yeah. And, and it was from the guy who I ended up having to kick out of the garage, the Vespa Pro. He <laughs> gave that to me as a gift, and I'd <laughs> never gotten into it, and I found it, and I was like, oh... This would be sweet. And so I started looking online to buy one for, for every student. Right. Yeah. yeah right. And that's unrealistic. They don't exist. No. Yeah. But then I came across the the V8, the see-through V8, yeah. and they, the school supply places had them. Yeah. The and invisible so, V8 or the visible V8, if you guys were my age or these guys. Sears catalog. Sears yeah, catalog yeah, yeah, had them. Yeah, yeah. And you could buy a plastic see-through and it turned the crank and it crank yeah and and the, the valves it open leds <gasps> and they light up now it's so and, fucking cool and so we bought those we drove them to each girl's house at magnificat specifically and yeah. i went up in the attic and i had all these cameras set up because bendix gave us this big ass grant and they funded our whole like studio up in my home attic and so oh, we got all these fantastic. ipads and yeah and then each girl took their phone and focused it on their hands, and they would watch what I'm doing. And then I could see on my screen, I could see the girl's hands, and I could say, well, you know, you're doing that wrong. And we built the entire thing. And then from there, I was like, well, shit, that worked out really well. I'm going to go into the building, and I'm going to pull all the 350 engines out of the bikes, and we're going to deliver 350 engines to the girls and we made little tiny two by two wooden stands. <laughs> and so my wait wife a second. I, you were going to people's houses yeah. that may or may not be okay with grease and oil. Correct. 
and you delivered grease and oil containment systems yep. to people's houses. Yes. Fucking amazing. And sometimes they were set up in the living room. Sometimes they were set up in the dining room. Sometimes we had to take a two-wheel dolly and and wheel the thing down into the basement. We gave John a CB350 motor for his birthday one time. <laughs> <laughs> we wrapped it up in boxes awesome. and shit. And we gave it to him. They're heavier than you think. Yeah, they're 130 pounds. <laughs> Down in the basement of Mayho. We're in Mayho's basement. Yeah. And then <laughs> I had, your birthday present. And, everybody, and then I had to carry it back out. I'm like, what the fuck? I'm out. We had to yeah. carry that heavy son of a bitch down there. Oh, he had to carry it out. <laughs> so you're putting a 130 pound motor in a in a young woman's yeah uh, or a young man's yeah uh, in, in this her case, what? young woman's living room and and we set it up. We dropped off a brand new set of you know new craftsman piece of junk toolbox with yeah. all the tools. Yeah. And then every morning, we all got on Zoom, and they I would demonstrate the step, and then I'd watch all of them do it, and we'd all work together. And all This is the first time a child on a Zoom training thing wasn't literally snoring in or phoning it in or whatever, right. like faking it. Right, right. They're actually doing it. Yeah. It was so fucking cool. That's pretty cool. Man, it was cool. So then from there, we were like, well, shit, now we got three curriculums. We got the V8, yeah. we got just the engine, and we, we got, got the, the whole bike. bike. <gasps> And if they ever put a V8 in a CB350, you're the guy. <laughs> the only thing that, okay, so probably not with the engines, but with the bikes, right? Do they get to get to the point where they actually start it up? Yes. Because to me, that's got to be the most exciting yeah, thing. Yeah, they do. Like, it is. You know, that's what every time I get a bike that's not running and get it right like that first time, it fires up and it's running great and everything. That's just such a great satisfaction. And it's not pushing the button to start it, but we don't even tell them that it has a push button start. We're like, you got to kick to start this thing. So they just jump on it and they kick and they kick and they kick. And I'm sure if you don't know, you should know that girls are better than boys at every fucking thing on the planet. I agree. I don't care what, except for maybe lifting a heavy weight. If you know, men are made a little bit bigger and stronger, but in general, my wife told me the only reason that men exist is because she can't train the dildo to push the lawnmower. (laughs) These oh <laughs> girls are so much better at things. And when I say, hey, you just built this bike for the last five months. Mm-hmm. Now is kickstart day. They jump on it and they kick it until they're covered in sweat. And then the next girl takes her place and she kicks it until she's covered in sweat. And, and I'm talking like 90 or 100 kicks and then it starts. Right. And I'm thinking, after the tenth one, like, oh, I'm out. this fucker's not starting. No, I'm dragging it behind <laughs> a truck. I'm going to let him kick I'm it. I'm having John push me. And then they'd fucking do it. <laughs> they kick it. Yeah. And it starts. And they yeah. scream with joy. It's Brian's unreal. not telling them you have to have a battery there to support the spark. <laughs> <laughs> you just rather watch them kick their guts out. Well, you give them a dead battery, and eventually it'll charge up. Oh, it'll up. charge it up. <laughs> <laughs> so last year, I'm at their event. And he's got bikes scattered around the place, and it's pretty fancy. Kromke's wearing a fucking kilt and a tie and everything, looking all cool. He dresses up. Uh, Dressed so like we a show, Catholic schoolgirl. He actually kind of did, yeah. The uh, So we get there, and we're roaming around the place, and there's a little video going up there for anybody who wants to see it. The uh, What I absolutely love about this is we're roaming around, and there's these young kids that are in the building, and they got their families with them and stuff, right? And they're just so proud. I mean, these kids are super duper proud. And every about 11 seconds, you hear a CB350 just roar to life, <laughs> just anger stroked, just, and just, and just 10,000 RPM, yeah. just all of it, just feeding it throttle. <laughs> and you're like, what fucking, because we think we're like with our friends and we're like, what idiot started my bike in the house? Like, what idiot did that? And then you're like, no, this is actually where it's supposed to happen. Yeah. Because this is the environment where it's actually meant to happen. Yeah. But for a lot of them, that's the first time they've ever started or even revved up a motorcycle, oh, yeah. right? I mean, Absolutely. like that they've been putting their heart and soul into for how long? Yeah. Hey, and if they blow it up, they can just rebuild it. Yeah, they got the skills. <laughs> when the call went out, we need bring us your sick, your poor, your huddled CB three fifties. I had just thrown away three CB three fifties, and I was like, "Oh, fucking no!" You're Can I me. donate a motor to be rebuilt and brought back to me? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! There's the perfect... whole bike. Yeah, well, we know of a girl. Back. We know of a girl that will. You can send her carburetors, and she will re- rebuild your carburetors and send them back to you for a very small fee. Yeah. Yep. So the idea of supp- supporting Moto Go with a few shekels here and there that might not be a bad idea. I mean, I'd give like fifty, hundred bucks just to have a motor built. <laughs> No, I think you got to be at the Kickstarter level. I think you got to be at least at the five hondo. Uh, yeah. Right. 
So uh, talking that's about more than I pay for the bikes. <laughs> right. So now, so you have remote locations set up at which school? Uh, so we are at Shaker High, St. Joseph Academy, Gilmore Academy. Uh, really, you're at Gilmore? Yeah. Wow. I didn't think a, you could get a girl with a nine hundred dollar manicure to work on a fucking dude motor. They gave us a humongous space. I had the kids. This is only like the second time it's ever happened. I had the kids build the lifts and build the benches. We brought the lumber. You know they have laws about that, right? And yeah. the bikes. This is on like third floor. Oh no, yeah, no really? elevator. <gasps> Old story. What the fuck? So Old story. The basketball players. With straps pulled and pushed and pushed these things up three flights of stairs. They will never leave. Hey, guys. It's unreal. The future is safe. There are skilled, qualified people to change our diapers. Yeah. So nice. And, and so Gilmore is unbelievable. When I'm uh, so pumped about when it. When I worked for that other company, we mm -hmm. used to do a lot of the union stuff and promotions and everything like that. And I was the video guy. The boss of that company went to Gilmore, so he every year as a gift we would do their graduation videos and stuff, oh, right? Okay, so yeah. So I was like, I was always in the back on the spider pod filming their graduation, you know, and they'd always have these speakers come. So the one year, this is probably about the second year of me working there. This is like eight, nine years ago. Uh, they had some guy, and he gets there, and and he's uh, he's like he's giving the commencement speech to the kids. Yeah, so, thank you, John. <laughs> and uh, he's sitting there, and he's like, he goes, now most of you because you've gone through this school, are going to be in a position someday where you're going to have employees underneath you. And the Whoa. thing that you need to remember is you can't step on their necks too hard because you can break them. No. So, and I'm just like, wow. So that was a... I heard about the ladder speech. <laughs> be careful who you step on going up. You yeah, may yeah, yeah, need yeah. them coming down. No, this was... Your but that's a little bit more harsh. Oh, yeah. It was, it was pretty interesting. Kilmore. We're at Rhodes. We're going to be at John Marshall. Yeah. We're at Welsh Academy. What? You keep uh, going. Yeah. That's too many schools. We're at, uh, man, I know I'm forgetting. I'm at 11 now. Oh, oh, and one of the coolest things is on Saturdays, right. the local judges in the Cuyahoga County have been assigning students as their community service yeah. to come build motorcycles. <gasps> so on Saturdays, a guy shows up with like between 8 and 15 kids, right? and their community service is building motorcycles and so for three hours on saturdays we're having them prep the bikes that are going out to other schools and we're having them prep the engines that we're bringing to other schools and they're totally learning shit and they're using tools they've never touched before and that is probably the most rewarding that is program by far that i'm gonna stop did. you can i stop for a second there brian so do they yeah. come in with the idea that do the kids think that they're being punished or are, are they happy to be there? Or they, oh, think... they would be picking up trash in the middle of the freeway. I know, right. but do they recognize the opportunity or do Crazy. they come in with like a chip on their shoulder and then like leave like saying like, wow, I can't wait to come back next week. I'm going to get in trouble again. It's more of that. Okay. It's more of they come in. <laughs> they, they come in and they're. Send those kids to me. They're, they're not thrilled about what's going on. And then within 15 minutes of, of getting their hands dirty, they are super into it and all the macho-ness has been dropped and they are working with people that they don't know you know other kids these are, are all kids you coordinating are you dealing with these young folks oh yeah yeah you are yeah yeah you're dealing with people that are in a diversion program yeah from Cuyahoga County court system yep and it's magic wow. so so we have a friend named Stefan um, who runs Porco and when I met Steph many years ago his job was he had, he owned a business making very fancy European roll-up shutters. If you've ever been to Germany, you'll know what kind of shutters I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Fancy shutters for your business or your home. He built them. His father had the business, and he went in there, and it's very, very gritty, very dirty, whatever. It's fine. But what he was doing as an alternative source or a side hustle was he was driving the van that took the people in the yellow jumpsuits from Cuyahoga County out to clean up the trash on the highways and do community service projects. I saw a crew this morning out there in the rain. I was thinking, oh, you drew a uh, bad lot. So Stefan would take a van, a 15-pack van, with a trailer and a uh, um, outhouse, uh, you know, a, a comfort station, on the back of the trailer, and he'd go out, and he would straight up go to the side of the road, wherever the hell he was supposed to go, and Stefan would work with 15 guys, and he said it was one of the absolute most rewarding experiences of his life was 
getting to spend time with other people, but also kind of listening to their stories and understanding where they were yeah. in, the, in the process. These kids aren't picking up trash. These kids are learning one of the most valuable skills I've ever had in my life. Yeah. Hands down. One of the greatest ideas I've ever talked about is you talk about diversionary programs. There's diversionary programs for everything. I, I, I don't care what you get caught doing that you weren't supposed to be doing. There's a diversionary program Cider? for it because we don't have enough jail space in this, mm -hmm. in this place. Mm -hmm. So if we can get somebody out of jail and get them into a diversionary program, but most of the time diversionary programs are terrible. They're not great. They don't fix the problem. Yeah. What do you need? This actually is Louis? amazing. This is... Uh, There's one in the door. Uh, I... I can't scream enough about... I'm an atheist. I'm going to say you're doing God's work. Right, right. Right? I'm with uh, you. I'm with you on that. Okay. I, I mean, it's just, to me, that's, that's yes, amazing. And, and I'm assuming you, you read the postcard. I, I did. So I brought it with me. No, I'm good, thanks. Is that the postcard said, wish for, you were here? For those that... Postcard said, thanks for getting me into this, asshole. Yeah. <laughs> so, great uh, idea. Great idea. The, the crazy thing about... And, you know, we've known each other for over 20 years. Over 20 years, yeah. And, and I honestly, for the first 10 years that I knew you, didn't think you knew who the fuck I was. Because, you know, when you own a business where you deal with a million people a day, eventually you just have to smile and nod and, and act like you remember everybody, even if you don't, because it, it can otherwise hurt someone's feelings. And Absolutely. I figured that's what you were doing all the time. And now I know that that's... He does have a lot I know that's it. not the case. I really know that that's not the case, which is pretty fucking amazing to say that uh, you can remember that many names and faces. But you, you know, anyone that doesn't believe that you have your thumb on the pulse of the Cleveland scene is dead fucking wrong. And the fact that you took phone calls from me, and when I said, how the fuck do I get all four pistons on the CB750 into the cylinders at the same time and <laughs> compress all these things, and you were like... You just got to keep trying. You, you just got to keep trying it. There's no, there's no secret thing. I was like, and how do you get the gaskets off that are stuck? You just got to keep scraping. You got to be really careful. And, and, and I was like, and I'm, I'm having kids rebuild these CB750s at the school I'm teaching at right now. This is way before Skidmark, way before yeah. MotoGo. And you're like, you're doing what? I said, yeah, I had 12 kids tear these things apart. And you were, without saying I was crazy, you just went, man, that's great. We need way more mechanics in this world. We need, we need way more kids learning how to use tools. I fucking love what you're doing. Thank you for doing that. That's so great. And it pumped me up so fucking big because, you know, I, you're Phil Waters. You're, you are the Cleveland scene. And so that kind of fueled my passion to keep things going. And I knew I was on the right fucking track. And then as I was opening Skidmark... No, I was like, saying, better you than me, Brian. Better yeah. you than me. And you're like, one of the most important <laughs> things you can do is make it well lit. you got to make it well I, that's lit. That's what I told you. Dude. I was like, it has to be bright. Yeah. And when you try to find a fucking needle jet, dude. when you try to find something on the floor... Oh. The, the little bit of gems that you've passed oh. on to me over the years, I haven't forgotten a one of them. Yeah. Where did you go to high school? Strongsville. Strongsville. What was your shop program like? There were... I was never allowed to take it. Okay. So they had one. Okay. They had... Over or maybe they were over sending them all to Polaris. I don't remember. That, you over overqualified or underqualified? Uh, my dad, who was handy as fuck, could build anything, was under the impression that shop class was all stoners and flunkies, and he wanted me to go to college, and so he would not let me take it. Okay, so you were forbidden from your parents, not yes. from the school system. Correct. Okay, that's okay. right. So, Chris, where did you go to high school? Nations. Ignatius, right? So what was your shop program like when you were in high school? Squatouche. No shop There wasn't a shop no, program. No, no shop. That wasn't the direction that Ignatius no, was going. No, it's all And so I had my neighbors, college. my neighbor kids went to St. Ed's. Same thing. Yeah. Okay, John. I went to a rural high school mm -hmm. where actually a lot of the kids went to 4-H for half the day. And Future but Farmers of America, I right? enrolled in what was called Power Tech and Welding for four years of each of those. <laughs> Power Tech was an awesome class. We did everything from rebuilding lawnmowers. That was the first Wankel rotary motor I rebuilt. Yep. Uh, lawn, you know, tractors, and then I like the I was like the golden boy. So like, teachers would bring stuff in, and I would rebuild their tractor or whatever, fix cars, and then. Um, but we also learned how to you know build and frame a stud wall, mm -hmm. put the electrics in it, like just a ton of shit in that power. Tech vocational, class. literally vocational training. Yeah. Yeah. Pete, where'd you go to school? <laughs> 
Illyria High School. Okay, and now <laughs> I, I, I now I happen to know a little <laughs> something about Illyria High School. What was your what was your shop class like? There was a shop class system there. There was also a county vocational school yep. that um, did stuff similar to what right. John was saying. Yep. Um, I did not partake in the vocational training. Right, I was in more like a college prep thing, which. Yep. Ended up in the army. <laughs> but, but, but knowing a little something about Illyria, right? Yeah, so Illyria was rough. Illyria's, so this neighborhood that he was in, even in 1985, right? Uh, Close enough, yeah. Yeah, I know. We're, 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 we're being nice, okay? We're, we're, there's a four-year range here, right? Okay. So when, when we think about that, and I know that for you, shop class might not have been considered to be like where the smart kids were. Or where the talented kids were, or it was it just where the kids could smoke cigarettes? It was a catch basin. Yep, it was yeah. the bottom of the fucking food chain. See, for yeah. us, that was a w- shop class. That was woodworking. Woodworking. Yeah. yeah. And and then also, uh, as you pull the chain and the elephant light better light up. And then yeah. weldings where we smoked dope and the, yep. we'd go in the <laughs> welding thing because you can't smell. Yeah. Strike right. an arc and everything. Yeah. <laughs> See, it was complete. <laughs> So what to, about you? I went to Nordonia, and they had like a small shop class there, but then they would send you over to the Cuyahoga Valley Vocational School. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to go there so fucking bad because yeah. all my friends, like I was into hot rods and shit, yeah. so all my friends went there. But my mom, my dad worked for TRW, so he was in the automotive industry. Yeah. And he was like, no, you're going to college. I fucking hated college. <laughs> <laughs> so like the compromise for me to go to college was right. to do music because I figured, well, okay, if I'm going to sure. be in college, I'll do music. But the funny part was, is their argument, it's like, you know, all you're going to do, if you go there, you're going to get a $30,000 a year job for the rest of your life, all this shit, right? Mm-hmm. Two of the guys I know that went were my good friends that graduated from the vocational school and started their careers at 18 in the exactly. industry right. are making like 190 grand a year now, like happy as clams running service departments somewhere, mm-hmm. doing whatever. But and my school wasn't a vocational school. No. It was a high school. It's it just, just had, was it at the high school. Shit exactly. Because I was in the college prep. I was in the mm-hmm. academic program. Right. But I filled up. My Don't let John fool you. He's super smart. Hoff. Hoff. What did what you do? Steve now, Hoff. Say a few now, things about that. now, Steve, you, you went to Euclid, right? Did you go to Euclid right. High School? Yeah, I went to Euclid. Right. Um, the junior high school forced us to. You no, know, everybody did shop. Right. You fine. had to do shop or home ec, right? Yeah, and shop was fine. I mean, right. it was fun. And then uh, in high school, I wanted to go to aviation high school. Oh, oh shit. Oh, yeah. That's but my dad open. wouldn't let me go. But then uh, the counselor placed me, or we had, like, because I worked full time. Yeah. And he got me a job at Euclid Nazi Motors. No, no. You mean Euclid Foreign Imports? Euclid, Euclid Nazi, Nazi Motors. Motors. <laughs> yeah. Martin. Yes, we have ways, no. we have ways of making you work in a Volkswagen. So I worked there for a couple of years, and, and that was kind of like sh- that was like my shop class. So. Yeah. yeah, you worked there. You yeah. worked at Euclid. Yeah, that's fucking amazing. Yeah, I, I had no idea that you worked there. Yeah, well, my dad wouldn't let me go to aviation high school because right. he wanted me in all AP classes. Okay, all right, and and I had no college, idea they did a vocational was the worst ed thing. Experience of my life. Me at too. Martin's shop. I, I hated college. I mean, it was bullshit. Yeah, because the people there like are never going to have a real job. Did Euclid have an on-site auto shop project or auto shop program? I know they used to. Uh, they did have an auto shop. Uh-huh. Um, I, th- I mean, I'm more familiar with Lakewood because my kids went through the Lakewood schools. Yep, and Lakewood actually and has. They have a really good. They have really a really good, good auto shop. shop. Yep. They have a really good. Uh, I've been donating to them for a while. Yeah, and they have a really good engineer, like a, a yep. pre-engineering program. Yep. With uh, they have 3D printers and they yep. have a program that I was. Well, they have a makerspace that's. Second to none. Yeah, I was a mentor for a number of years mm-hmm. for uh, these kids would do a project and they would have to make an invention and market their own invention. God damn. And it was really, it was <laughs> a really good program. <laughs> the, the first kid made a, a rail gun. <laughs> America! They, but they decided that he wasn't allowed to do that. So then he made some... some he just uh, made a bomb and that was okay. A well, mortar. <laughs> he ended up making uh, like a... a Support for a drill to drill into ceilings. Okay, well, there you which go. is all right. But then some of the projects they did were really funny, like uh, like slow closing toilet seats, and like uh, one guy wanted to make a, a automatic. Hey, the dude who came up with the Swiffer, which is a gluey fucking rag, he's got the biggest house on Lake Road. Yeah, the guy who came up with a gluey rag on a stick, he's got the biggest house on Lake Road. Fuck you, money. It's the most expensive house ever to be listed in the state of Ohio. Did not sell. Uh, but yeah, but gluey rag on a stick, 
invent a slow closing toilet lid. Yeah, the the one I thought was good was they had a, a hammock, a self rocking hammock, which was pretty interesting. But the shop teacher, like like he wanted to do, I don't know what the hell was this had. mentor. Or was this Euclid? Lakewood. No, I was, oh, you're I Lakewood. was a mentor. Okay. Right. These kids. Oh, you were oh, a mentor. Sorry. Yeah, so we have a confusion so, in the state of Ohio with the term mentor and mentor. Yeah, mentor. There's mentor, mentor and there's mentor. Yeah. You can mentor somebody, but you can yeah, also mentor, spend yeah. a lot of money in mentor. And then there's a mentos, the fresh maker. <laughs> the fresh maker. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the shop teacher destroyed the whole project because... These kids wanted a like some mechanism to rock it. Yeah. So we came up with like like a cam, like a cam with a sure, uh, like a rotating. You mean a fucking machine? Like yeah. a, a perpetual okay. motion machine. A sex machine. <laughs> so he decided. I watched that, that channel, and yeah. it was a very simplistic thing. Right. But it would work, and it it's would like last. a shaft and a yeah. it's eccentric cam. Right. Right. Yeah. But he wanted to change it, and when he changed it, the thing totally failed because okay. it, his design was inferior. Ha. So, okay, well, whatever. So, Tom, I mean, I Tom, did you go to high school in West Virginia? Yep. I know that you were in some sort of theater and arts program. I did. I, but uh, was there a shop program there? There was a shop program. I went to Nitro High School. Did you say nitrile? Nitro? <laughs> nitro. Like, like yeah. nitro. Travis right. Nitro, <laughs> nitro <laughs> cellulose is actually what it was named after. <laughs> okay, all right. But um, the shop teacher there, we actually had a shop program. You went to Cordite High School, and there was... <laughs> Pretty <laughs> much. You right. had two fingers. But uh, <laughs> yeah, only two. <laughs> but we had, uh, we had a really basic... You have four. No, three and a half days to complete this project. <laughs> <laughs> really, really basic, yeah. basic woodworking, yeah. a little bit of metalworking, nothing, nothing major. Did you have uh, belt sander races where you rode the belt sander? Actually, the only time I ever had belt... The... Yeah. No, we, we, we did the had... um, Jesus Christ. carbon dioxide powered cars. Oh, oh. Um, did a couple of those like like that's uh, actually pretty fucking cool. And All right. like I mean, it was just like um, the so what is the the Boy Scouts know. do the Pinewood Derby? Yeah, Pinewood Derby. Like Pinewood Derby. Cars okay. With, All right. So pretty too. pretty basic. Pretty wood basic shop stuff. stuff. We did yeah. that nothing, with nitrous oxide nature. at my high school, but nobody ever raced the cars. <laughs> the <laughs> balloons <laughs> that don't float. Get but the balloons they, um, that don't float. The they whoa, had I was it Ben Franklin vocational. Which is where all the kids just kite were, flying, exactly. just kite well, flying where, all day long. <laughs> yeah, and then you know, very basic computer science, very basic drafting yeah. stuff. Okay. So that's like, like more of a major. STEM thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I mean, it was not even that. Like the, the yeah. basic foundation of it. Cromkey. Cromkey. Now, did you have an auto shop class where you went to school? Not auto shop. But we buggy. had small engine repair. Small, yeah, there you go. Uh, metal yeah. shop, wood shop. House, so you had all the shops. House wiring, advanced <laughs> electronics. Um, where was this? Western Wisconsin, La Crosse, was Wisconsin. He was you know, hanging out with yeah, fucking Meckle <laughs> Fresh over here getting a good school. It was after Chris was out of high school. <laughs> <laughs> Just a while, barely, yeah. but... Quite yeah. a while, yeah. Man. Late 70s. Late 70s. Yeah. I mean, by the time I was 14, yeah. I, I had older friends. I was tuning their cars up and changing their oil for them. And that's what I wanted to bring up. In my particular high school, which is Wycliffe, which is a... Uh, sort of a next ring suburb of Cleveland. It's east side, and it's a blue collar town. It's it's not a town for the wealthy people. It's a town for people that worked at TRW. You know, it's a town for people that worked at Reliance Electric in those places. White Motors. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And so Lubrizol is you know headquartered in Wycliffe, Ohio. They just came in today and sponsored the benefit. All right. I, I was gonna. I I got a phone number for a guy. But I'm glad they stepped up. That's super cool. Um, but. That's kind of where I grew up was there was, it wasn't, you weren't being pushed hard to go to college. Our vocational education program, our shop class was heavy in the middle school with the wood items, with the tree carcasses and stuff like that. But then once you got to high school, you were like fucking game on because then they had welding. Then we had auto shop. Mm. Then we had technical drawing. They had an amazing photo studio, right? We had all these things that were designed to acknowledge the trades and acknowledge that. I wish we had a plumbing, like we should have had that. We didn't have that. And like you said, trimming out a house, like going to the studs, doing basic electrical. <gasps> yeah, learning how to put an outlet in. Fuck switches, yeah, man. Build, That's, build everything in a wall. We didn't have that, but we had a guy that was a heavy hitter, and his name was Mr. Croft. And Mr. Croft had the pocket protector, the short sleeve button-up shirt. Mm -hmm. That is a sign of 
you have truly reached the epoch of your existence when you have a short sleeve dress shirt. Mr. Brayshaw. Right. And we all remember their names, right? Yes. Mr. And Speedy. And he have a comb he has a he had a comb over that only I now appreciate. <laughs> so because I'm there. And uh, but but here's the deal. As much as people thought that you took auto shop if you were a burnout. I don't know if other people have the term burnout, but burnout was a term in our high school that meant the guys that like to smoke the devil's lettuce and stuff yes. and and <laughs> wear the you know bell bottom <laughs> pants and have the van halen mirrors in the back of their van Je- jean jacket shirt with the uh, hoodie underneath it yes or jean jacket with jean jacket with the hoodie underneath it yeah. exactly so auto shop was d- designed to be like and so but i'm i'm going to tell you i term i use the term band fra- fag with like a letterman jacket with all four years me too i'm the guy i was in marching band but i also am a degenerate fucking grease monkey hmm. right and so I would basically only go to marching band and auto shop tech drawing and all of the trades classes, all wow. vocational stuff. Everything else I failed. Huh. Not joking. Failed hard. Wow. Um, I was undiagnosed. Okay. Because yeah, if back then. It wasn't then, for the straight A's and power tech and welding. I don't know. That's exactly it. And I kept trying to pad my fucking schedule with more shop shit. But at our high school, every teacher's car got worked on for free. Whoa. Think about the power of that. That's awesome. Think about the power of the vocational education program. Think about the power of auto shop when every... Do you want to drive home today? Exactly. (laughs) And Chris, Chris, we need funding for our shop class. Who's going to vote for it? Every fucking teacher. Because they don't know what it costs to get an oil change. They don't know what it costs to have a transmission put in their, you know, 84 citation. They have no idea because for the past 20 years... Wycliffe High School's auto shop has been doing their maintenance. Wow. And 14, 15, 16, 17-year-old kids are doing first-line service tech work in a, sh- a good shop environment. We were also cutting apart Volkswagen Beetles and making buggies, dune buggies out of them. We were also taking a Cadillac to Thompson Drag Speedway to learn how much weight you could take out of a four and a quarter and make it go super fast. I can see a this. big block V8, how, how much weight can you take away from a Cadillac and make it run a 13-second quarter? Wow. Not adding horsepower to it, taking weight away from it. So the physics class was involved. <laughs> that doesn't exist anymore. The money uh, for that doesn't exist. One kid gets his finger cut off, and the whole program goes away. Yeah. And it's not even one kid losing his finger. It's the parents being scared somebody's going to lose a sure, finger. Sure. So what you're doing, taking heavy, dangerous motorcycles from another century and taking them into a school, especially the schools he listed, you're kind of weird, dude. You're on different ends of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. I noticed some of the schools you listed are schools that are war zones. Mm -hmm. And I noticed some of the schools you listed are schools that are affluent. In in white white zones. A semester. Yeah. That was my first motorcycle too. I took it into class. And worked on it. They let me work on it. Oh, it, oh yeah, yeah. Auto so shop. I took it into high yeah. school. And me too. My dad dropped yeah. it off and everything, yeah. and then we got in big trouble because I got it running. I wasn't a rebel, but then Bobby Pichetta was like, should I take it Not for a ride? Bobby. I'm like, yeah, go ahead. Take it for a ride. Did he ride it? He took it for a lap around the school, and the yeah. principal came running back there. Who the fuck is out there riding on the motorcycle? It's Bobby. <laughs> but we could bring our own cars. We could bring our cars into Auto Tech, an auto shop, and I would skip the classes like math and English and history. U.S. American history. And I would get passes out of those classes to go to the auto shop to work on my own shit and other people's shit. And in 1987, I had a 1980 Dodge Omni that I can tell you participated in spo- spoiled children crashing automobiles. That's SCCA. <laughs> so I had a Dodge Omni in SCCA at Mid-Ohio and nice. Nelson's Ledges. As a 17-year-old wow. because nice. of auto shop. Mm. And I did not have enough money. I'll be hand to God. We were welfare cheese. There is no way in fuck that all the shade tree mechanics and all the cool shit that people talk about racing. Racing's expensive. Mm. Even at a grassroots level. You want to talk about 24 hours of lemons. It's cheap. $500 cars. Mm. My ass. That's a $3,000 roll cage. You can need a high... You know, you need all the shit. Yeah. The car is not the most expensive part of the operation it's everything else if you want to go race a 500 dollars car bmw bring more wallet dude i raced yeah. rc cars professionally yeah 
and that was expensive. I can't even imagine how having much fucking- the fact that I had a high school where my high school, my high school shop teacher, would help me work on a 1980 Dodge Omni, and put a motor that didn't belong in that particular car because it had been blown up, and take a junkyard motor and put it in and help me do that and help me understand what I was going to have to do to be able to run in a class at SCCA. And then give me the time to go do that hmm. on a kid that has his source of income was working at Bob's Big Boy and delivering papers and maintaining that 0.968 grade point average. And I just, <laughs> I, just had, I just had this huge conversation about this, about the current guidance counselors and stuff. And like when like in other countries, they recognize kids skills yeah. and their interests. And then, holy shit, when you give the kid like uh, access to more of what he's interested in, amazing how well they do at it when the same kid they're basically going to send him to see if he's on the spectrum because during math class he's an idiot yeah because he has no fucking interest in it and so nobody's even this the standardized testing and all that shit has made it so that we're learn the kids are learning stuff that's relevant to nothing all these life skills and things that you can actually use are not being but taught. brian's gotten into some schools yeah, no that's what i'm saying this is like what how many more doing, brian's can we make that's what that would be the thing i would argue that most kids don't need school past eighth grade you're probably right. I mean, what my daughter knew in eighth grade mm-hmm. was anything you would possibly need for 90% of the jobs out there in the world. Hmm. There you go. Hey, the rest of the other everything class, else is vocational. The next four years yeah. should have been focusing on whatever she, like something yeah. specific. That's, that's, that's And if you something. find what a kid's interested in, dude, when I was a kid, I hated everything except for music, right? Mm-hmm. That's what all I cared about. And, and motorcycles and right. stuff, but I didn't even know that you could do that. That was just, <laughs> I just, that was just a dream. You know what I mean? Every time you lean towards a motorcycle, they pushed you towards yeah. a guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but I'm saying, like... But so like, what has know, changed? I like them both now. Well, the funny <laughs> thing is they... I was told by my very first ever, like, motorcycle guy in my life, right? Yeah. He said, if you love motorcycles, you'll never have money for drugs. Well, that's not true. You've managed to figure it out. Yeah, right. <laughs> that's not true at all. I just I grew my own drugs. They don't have to pay anybody for them. That's, that's not a problem. I just, you know, when, when we think about the time that I wasted not wrenching on motorcycles. Right. That's okay? the way I feel. My guidance counselor in 1986, when I was about to fail my junior year and was signing the paperwork for the United States Army and the delayed entry program with... My left hand, while my right hand had my middle finger extended firmly towards my high school staff, <laughs> high school career, high school, you know, body, saying, <coughs> Uncle Sam is going to get me because I took an ASVAB test and I'm, the, I'm going to be 18. So everything that happens here in the city of Wycliffe me- means nothing right. because I have somewhere to go. I has an, have an ASVAB, Armed Forces, Armed, Armed Services Voc- Vocational Aptitude Battery. I have a test that says that they're taking me. That's, that's in paper now. I signed my name that to means it. your job's done. <laughs> right. So nothing you do now can fuck with me. Right. So I raised a finger up to her, and she said, well, Phil, you're going to pump gas for the rest of your life. Now, to high school counselor Mary Soul, I'm naming you <laughs> and shaming you. Yeah. Mary, you were right. Today, I pumped at least 15 gallons of gas That's right. into motorcycles that I sold mm-hmm. in my multi-million dollar company. Right. <laughs> Fuck you very much. Right? Fuck you very much. Right. Fuck you for making me take summer school for English three times. Fuck you for making me take summer school for phys ed twice. <laughs> right? Wow. Think about that. Fuck you for making my high school harder when I was trying to earn money to support my family. Mm my family, a family of five that was living on my newspaper money. When my father was building and repairing cars in our backyard to pay the bills because the society that we lived in sent his job to China, Mm -hmm. right? And our part of the world, the east side of Cleveland, went from being very employed to very unemployed in the mid 80s due to corporations moving their jobs elsewhere. That giant sucking sound that we heard in Cleveland was jobs leaving and manufacturing leaving. So we all had to figure out a way to pay our bills. These vocational classes that we grew up around were the only escape or the only future for a lot of young people. The fact that you're doing that today, I hope 
that people can cut through the bullshit of our podcast and understand that it's fucking important, man. Yeah. It is important. It's so important. And the, the fact that you're getting to deal with, I did not know about the diversionary program, folks, because that's killing me right now. That's the best thing in the world. Mm -hmm. Because as a former police officer, some of you know that I used to do that job, juvenile people that were in the system as juveniles, there is no system for juveniles. It's horrible. Hmm. It's really, really fucking bad. So anybody who can come up with a system to take somebody who's 15 or 16 or 17 and prevent them from becoming the next link in the chain, because it is a link in the chain. And if you can interfere with that chain, you got something. Mm -hmm. if, you can make, if you can make 50 motorcycle mechanics, that's the best thing we'll ever have. It's and the greatest thing we'll ever have. You know, sometimes we get, we get 12 kids on a Saturday and we'll have a couple of them where we'll see the light bulb. Yeah. Which is, you can go a whole year teaching in a regular school and not see that light bulb once. But you can see it every Saturday working with these kids from the county. And it never fails every Saturday as they're getting ready to leave. I pull the one kid aside and I'm like, dude, you can do this. You can do this. Right. And he's like, lights up. Yeah. He's like, well, I always kind of thought maybe I wanted to work on cars or motorcycles. And you really think I can do this? I'm like, fuck, dude. You figured out how to use all the tools immediately. And you led a team and communicated and got everyone to do what needed to be done. And you worked. And, and you were pleasant the whole time. I'm like, I don't know what you did to get yourself here. But you can get yourself out. And you can do this. And. I mean, he walks out of there like king shit. Yeah, somebody appreciated me. It's fucking, and no one's telling him that. No. No one else is telling him that shit. No. It's, oh my God. Sarah but he's a leader. Greatest. Yeah. That's so, a leader. So, Brad, That's how, a person. How long have you been doing this with the diversionary program? Um, four or five years. Okay, so have you had anybody circle back? Somebody like from year one that's come back to you said... You changed my life. I met a guy last year that was one of your students that came back and was functioning as an instructor. Uh, and I don't know what program he was in. There was, there was one kid from the very beginning that I, we took on, and we would give him hours at MotoGo. I was giving him hours at Skidmark. Mm -hmm. He was so into it, and he was in a gang, and he was like... And another guy at the garage had been in a gang and served time, and right. I put those two together and convinced him to get out of that fucking gang before things get bad. This kid was fantastic. And then playing basketball, kid got pissed off about some lippiness and that was, shot yeah. him in the chest and killed him. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, we've had a couple other kids that have reached out and come back. And I'm gonna stop you right there. That really wasn't the success story I was looking for. <laughs> I mean that was. <laughs> That, that was that was that, no. I mean, I'm looking for the positive here. That that that's a that's a poignant story and that's a sad that story. That's the best but, Cleveland moto cut ever. Wow. <laughs> Shit. I was hoping you were gonna have a. <laughs> no, what I meant Pete's was back, folks. <laughs> Brian, I'm here for hugs. I'm not, <laughs> I was looking for a success story. I was not like that. That that's not that's not a positive story. You just told I don't buddy. Have, I don't have a story where afterwards a kid came back and did a bunch of work and then got a job at uh, a dealership or a garage. Okay. Or, no, but do you have a story where yet. the kid came back and slowly took off their glasses and they were a hot chick? <laughs> <laughs> but that's not necessarily no. what it's about, okay? Because we all know that working on motorcycles and riding motorcycles is a lot more about it. For most of us, that's not our profession and that's not what we do to make a living. But it's a very valuable and rewarding part of our lives and because of that, we've met other people like right. you, and it and it and it's just something to have. It's a piece of happiness. It's a weird it's something community that, that gives yep. you a sense of accomplishment. And he, and even if it doesn't mean that it's what you you earn your living by, at least it's a skill set. And I tell my daughter this because she's probably going to get her permit this summer. Yep. But if you get your motorcycle license, if you ride a motorcycle, yep. you're part of less than one percent of the people out there. Like it's point oh two percent of people who actually get their motorcycle license. And to me, it's just one of those little life things that you can 
it's a notch in your belt. It's a, a thing that can say, you know, that's one thing I do that a lot of people don't. A lot do. of people don't do. So I have well, a question for you, Brian. So, like, oh, you by have, the way, on the, on the screen right now is Molly. Um, if you're ever going to do anything with Moto Go, you're going to meet Molly. Uh, Molly is this amazing. She calls me and reminds me that I got to make a donation. <laughs> she reminds me that it's time for me to buy my tickets to the events. Um, so M Molly, when we talk about like in every organization, there's so much more than Brian can possibly handle. Oh, this yeah. this got way out of his out of, way out of his control, fucking eight years ago, six really years fast. ago. Um, the fact that wrangling this thing and the fact that when we talk about what a small what john's saying such a small percentage of people ride motorcycles it's it's tiny one tenth of one percent in the united states so one tenth of one percent the fact that you found somebody that's an enabler hmm. an enabler mm -hmm. who just took that and went well oh, that's cool and when you when we think about the teams your daughter would not be into motorcycles if it wasn't for you. Okay? You are the reason that she's in that crazy world. We all went to AMA Vintage Days. We all go to Mid-Ohio. We go to Band Camp. We go to places where chaos rules supreme, right? <laughs> and it's fucking ludicrosity at every goddamn turn. But Piper becomes part of the team. Piper started from being just hanging out and just sort of being, I just want to be an observer. I just want to hang back. I just want to hang back and be an observer. I just want to see what's going on. And now Piper's grabbing a helmet, grabbing a bike and hauling ass. That's amazing. Yeah. Molly is a grade A enabler. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about somebody taking a potential, a person who might be slightly concerned or I'm sorry, might be slightly interested in doing a motorcycle thing and doing what Moto Go is and what Skidmark is too. Molly has been fantastic for getting these people involved. She's she's a very good catalyst. Yeah. Uh, do you see her as a bridge? Because she is a bridge. From from the students and the family members that might just look at Skidmark and look at Skidmark and go like, okay, this is a big goddamn crazy motorcycle co-op. Motorcycles are already scary. And now we have a bar and a stage and, and work spaces. And there's a loud motorcycle over there and there's one leaking oil and Jesus Christ, Castillo just set something on fire. <laughs> right. Um, but Molly's rap to people that I know has always been very much like, no, this is on target. Yeah, and she's, she's not a motorcycle person. And that's my fucking... She, yeah, she doesn't ride. She, no. She got her license to say that she's got it, but yeah. she's, she's, she's not. A, she's a liaison. She will not I ride, doesn't want to ride. She's fantastic. The way that she reaches out to people, the way that she encourages people to do these things, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah, she's good. It, it really is because... Skidmark wouldn't exist without her. MotoGo certainly... I, uh, I, Skidmark may have started, but it would have sunk quick. I... I Believe me, I have nieces and nephews, and I have tried to infect them with the motorcycle gene. Like, you know, and I learn now as an adult, the more you try to get somebody sent to something, the less likely they're going to they're gonna want to do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's your dream. You want everybody that's behind you to get it and grasp it. My, I grew up in a household where motorcycles were goddamn 100% forbidden. Yeah, me too. Mm -hmm. Forbidden. Mm -hmm. And it took me joining the army and leaving the fucking country to put a two-wheeled vehicle under my legs that wasn't hidden behind a barn somewhere, that wasn't an illegal two-wheeled vehicle, right? An illegal dirt bike. We so, talked about our hatred for our fathers at one point last uh, evening after the yeah. last podcast. Yeah. A little bit of it like carries that. a little weight there. But the one thing I will, <laughs> yeah. I, I really couldn't, you know, I my father actually took me yeah. to buy my first bike. Hated Holy bike. Like, fuck. he had a bike, but he got rid of it. He, got, he was in an accident, so he yeah. really wasn't hot on it. Okay. But... I was able to talk him into going and buying that first bike for fifty bucks and bringing it home. And wow! Now, of course, Chris he brought his it. kids into my shop like it was a fucking away mission. I he mean, brought his kids in. and He was like, "Okay, this is where we are, yeah. right?" I got look seriously. Yeah, you did. I know. And I know. like, and got, I loved it. Got him shop shirts and the whole fucking deal. Like, his kids got introduced to a passion that he had on the back burner for a long time. Like when when you got lit back up. Did you stop riding motorcycles 
because of your kids? Yeah, basically. Yeah. That happens. I yeah. mean, that's a real thing, yeah. right? Yeah, I just give him credit for that. That wasn't a whole lot of good things, but he let me get that one bike. Hey, 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 there you go. I mean, that's it. I mean, I longed for a bike for a long time. That was like 16, 17. I garbage picked a bike. I built it, and I wasn't allowed to ride it. <laughs> he let me buy oh. it for 50 bucks, and then he turned around and sold it for 250 Oh. <laughs> After I got busted, giving my girlfriend a ride, and, and he kept the money. Was that your five hundred? <laughs> no, I had the TS two fifty. Oh, kept the money. Yeah. <laughs> and he kept the change. That's what I was going to ask you. So, like, I, I saw a lot of the work is you know a lot with a lot of girls, right? Mm-hmm. So, do you sense like? So you said like, I, I agree with you too that women can usually do most things better. But do you sense, do you see like the awakening of like, oh shit, I know something now even more so than most of the dudes I know. You know what I mean? Like, So a lot of the girls, we, we spend the first day or two doing nothing but getting to know each other because in order to learn. Wait, quick question. It's only girls, right? No. Mm-hmm. Okay. No, but he no, just no, said it's, that it's, this open to anybody. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but it seems like you have a, a certain, several classes of all females. Yeah, right? we, we, if we could choose... Our focus, we would be working only with the underserved people. We'd be working with the kids in the Cleveland schools, and we'd be working with girls. That's pretty much what, that's kind of the mission. We do work with the wealthy schools because, and we tell them up front, <clears throat> you're going to be paying full price for this because with that money, we can now serve the schools that don't have the money. And we can right. we can kind of, sub your, your money is going to subsidize us going to the schools that can't afford it. And by and large, every school is like, great, more kids need this. So schools get it. Yeah. But and by the way, that's magical. It, the fact that you can convince people to share, yeah, it's, that's amazing. Do you, do you sell it as we're going to learn to mo- work on motorcycles, or do you sell it as we're going to learn mechanical skills in general? Uh, in general, I sell it as we're going to teach the kids how to fail, and we're going to teach them how to solve problems. Okay. We d- I, Beautiful. I, I tell them definitely we are not doing this to become mechanics. And I mean, and if they do, it's great. But if they don't, it's great. And we're not doing this to steer you away from college. We're not doing this for any other reason except you have no way, you've never learned with your hands, and you are terrified of failing, and you don't understand that in order to learn, you have to fucking fail. And so, and in order to fail, you have to feel comfortable failing in front of your peers. And that's terrifying as fuck. So we get to know them for the first couple of days, and we let them understand that, you know, I tell them from the get-go, I flunked out of college really quickly. I failed a lot in my life, and I didn't understand how great it was to not memorize things that are put in front of me in a classroom. I thought that was learning my whole life until I replaced an engine in my Volkswagen. And then I realized, holy shit, I just learned to do this with my hands, this is the greatest thing ever. I'm going to learn everything I can possibly learn. I went back to college, decided I had to be a teacher because I didn't want one kid to waste high school. Right, and that's, and that's another thing, too. I think we should acknowledge that for a second. How long have you been an educator? Uh, I was an, a legit... No, you're still an educator. I'm still an educator, yeah. but I worked in the traditional school systems for about 10 years. Right, and you started working in the school systems in what year? 2003. Okay, so you've been an educator for 21 years now. Yeah, yeah. Right. There's no better way to put it. I, I happen to live with an educator, right? Yeah. She uh, runs the entire school system. Well, okay. We, you said it. People know. We all know. When, when the mail comes to the house and it says to Dr. Waters yes. and Mrs. Waters, I'm Mrs. Waters. <laughs> okay? That's fine. And you guys all know it. Yeah. Y'all know merit, right? Do they yeah. really do that? It happens. You know they do that. It yeah, happens. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I just want to make sure that people understand that Everything that we do, and I know that this group of people, and I, I, and I have held court with all of you, when we are somewhere, Hoffert was probably the first person that I saw do this and do it like, Hoffert's working on a bike, and it was one of those rides. Do you remember when we used to do those, uh, those Cleveland, uh, Cleveland dirt bag rides? Mm-hmm. We used to do those. Dirt bag? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. All right, 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 right. I'll let you yeah, we had another name for it. Uh, so Let's just say D-bag. D-bag rides, All right? Okay, so, yeah, we had some rides that we would do in Cleveland that were the opposite of the Quaker Steak and Lube bike nights. And we would make sure that we would do them on the same night as a Quaker Steak and Lube bike night. Awesome. But we would go to more fun places and more interesting places. And we picked up a weird crew 
of people here in Cleveland that didn't want to go to Quaker Steak and Lube and trip over 5,000 Harleys. Mm -hmm. We had a pretty interesting group. And we would always wander off into the field somewhere. Like, we would literally go, like, I don't know, where are we going tonight? I don't know, let's see, what's, let's see where we go tonight. And let's two, go through the tunnel down to Edgewater. <laughs> Maybe we went to a lot of places motorcycles aren't allowed to go. <laughs> that might have happened. Okay, there might have been some maximum velocity exits to, you know, Whiskey Island or what have you. I don't know. But I watched Steve one time when one of us was having a mechanical problem. And... Steve didn't know it, but 17 guys were in a circle watching him carefully, right? He was teaching. Hmm. And Steve was teaching, and he didn't know he was teaching. He was just telling probably me or John about this. But 17 people were in a circle around him, and you could have heard a fucking pin drop. Because every single one of these guys will take the time to explain something to you. And not just blow you up and not just say like, well, that's the way it works. Tough shit. Like, this is how I do it. No, I won't. You got to figure it the fuck out. <laughs> okay. All right. But you know what's crazy? Yeah. And that never goes away. Yeah. So like the more you get into something, mm -hmm. like, so like, like me with guitar playing or whatever, I've been doing it forever. Yeah. But when I get around somebody that's better than me, no yeah. matter how long I've done it, yeah. you're like, oh, I want, what, what knowledge do you have? Like you're excited to learn. Like, so no matter how good you are, there's always that feeling of like learning more yeah. from somebody else that knows more. I, you know? I've seen people at this table control the room because it was clear there's this vortex when somebody's doing something with their hands. The room slows down. Mm. And when you see somebody performing a card trick, when you see somebody performing close-in magic, when you see somebody doing something that's a skilled, amazing thing that they've learned and taken the time to learn, that gets your attention. You'll you'll stop what you're doing. When they start whispering. <laughs> yeah, John in a carburetor. When they get real quiet. When you see when you see John approach a carburetor, right. you just yeah. sit down and watch. You just hang back, <laughs> right? You just fucking hang back. Well, let's see so, more of John with a weed whacker. <laughs> <laughs> when you see Tom mixing just a drink. Anytime John's whacking is <laughs> but, but, magical. So the idea is being the, so mm. if you can pass that along. So if you can take that and you can pass it along. And I don't care if you make YouTube videos that tell people how to do things. You're part of the solution, not part of the problem. Um, whatever it is, don't just repeat the guy falling down. Like, don't just play that. Don't do a commentary on somebody else's YouTube video of the guy falling down. Let's make, make a video telling somebody how to do something. Make a video showing somebody how to do something. Well, Take a all, group of your friends. All of us watch a lot of YouTube. Yes. And we learn a lot from YouTube. We do. Be the good content creator. Not the guy that's just repeating himself 14 times and think putting about, bullshit recycled stuff on there or pointing out the obvious. Think so about what, the guy so. during the pandemic that exploded. He was a dad that started to post videos for his daughter that was at college. Rover? But, Mark Rover? No, not him. This uh, is an older guy. He's like yeah. 65, whatever. His daughter was in college. Yeah. And so she asked like how to do something to her door. Oh, I saw that. Yes. So he made yeah. a video. Right. And right. then it got like a like 5,000 yeah. views. So right. then he was like, hmm. Maybe other kids don't. So then he showed how uh, there's to also the gr a, a There's drain. also a grumpy dad's plumbing thing. Yeah. Where the guy's like, the guy's a plumber who's been a plumber for 30 fucking years, but his son, who's doing something in you know the corporate world, still appreciates that his dad is incredibly knowledgeable about plumbing. Yeah. And shot, shoots video. He asks his dad, like, what about tankless heater systems, tankless water heaters? And his dad's like, oh, fuck. <laughs> and his dad's just like, all right, so if we're going to go down this rabbit hole... Steve installed our mini splits at our shop. Steve did. That guy back there. He had to take a class to get certified to install mini splits. <laughs> Didn't you? Holy shit. You had to get a, a certificate, a refrigerant certificate so you could buy them. Okay. Just to buy them. Just to buy them. Yeah, because the federal government won't let you buy a, mini, a charged mini split if you don't have a refrigerant license. Okay, so that's how much he wanted to help a brother out. Wow. That he got certified to buy them and then installed them in my shop. What I'm telling you that I've seen some magic in my life, I've seen some magic in my life. I have seen some magic in my life. We put a lift in my fucking, sh in my lift in my garage. No, normal garages don't have lifts. 
but we got a motherfucker of a lift in my garage. And I built a super tall garage so we could have a motherfucker of a lift in our But I called all my friends, and not one of us are certified lift installers. <laughs> but if you have six half asses, it equals at least 2.5 whole asses. Yeah, yeah. And we did it though, and we and all, every year we get under cars on that lift, and we don't die. No, the key is to have really thick concrete. <laughs> <laughs> now I do have six inch concrete, yeah. so I did go fifty yeah, percent over. Leave a moto concrete. six inches or actual? Six yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's an actual six <laughs> inches. Yeah, it's a regulation six inches, not Cleveland moto six yeah, inches. Right. Yeah, mm. it's true. But like, so that's what we joke about. Like, we have never been afraid to tackle a project, mm. right? Our group of people is always like, well, you know. Are you scared? Well, I'm scared too, but let's be scared together and do it. Yeah. I had a good friend, and he was actually a crackhead, but he did teach me. <laughs> oh, boy. Here we go. <laughs> but he, he, did, he, did, he helped even me, because I, I'm, I'm, I wasn't shabby at the time, but he got me, he, he called it thumb sucking. And he's like, you know, don't, don't just sit there sucking your thumb and overanalyzing and trying to think and make sure you know what you're doing. Because he had a perfect, he would just tear the shit apart. He was a crackhead, right? So he would just fucking just tear. We talked about stuff. that earlier. <laughs> but there was a certain value to that. It's yeah. like you can sit there and look at it and try to figure it and right. read and right. Google it on your phone and everything. But until you go out in your garage and take it apart and actually lay hands yeah. on it, you're really not doing anything. But you, know? you don't and, have, and, you don't order parts until you tear it apart no, but, and, and what, find out what's wrong. But with what it. makes that so much easier to do now is everybody has a self-replicating like fucking yeah. how did I take it apart machine in their yeah. fucking pocket. You yeah. take a picture of everything you take off. Well, like you say, you know, uh, is this generation going to be able to change our diapers? The one that thing that gives me hope is the internet and YouTube and like right. there's no reason you can look anything up and figure out how to do it if you just have to. Before the internet existed. My solution for a blown up motor was to take the motor apart and then buy another car that had the exact same motor in it and use that as a three dimensional one to one scale model that I could then take apart and find out the way it was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. So then at the end of the mission, I had the one that was okay and the one that's now back to being okay again, and I could sell one and or both of them having accomplished the mission. I have purchased so many motorcycles in my life just to be a three-dimensional workshop reference tool. Mm -hmm. Tom is intimately familiar with <laughs> two of them right now, right? But that's a real thing. And, and honestly, a one-to-one -one scale model of something that you can say, how does it look on this one? How does it look on that one? Because a Haynes manual, a Chilton's manual will only get you so far. That's what I was just going to, yeah. I was waiting for you to finish. Yeah. I am, was never trained and I am not self-taught mm -hmm. in my thing. Right there, those manuals yeah. that I, I gave you some of my old ones and stuff, yeah. I read. I read the manual and, if, and it's amazing what you can get out of a manual. It now is. you can use YouTube, but those are still very valuable. That's yeah. everything I learned, I read in a manual. You know. what, what do you got there, Brian? I've got a uh, Climber Kawasaki KZ650, 77 to 83. That'll, yeah, that'll get used. I've got a Climber Honda 125 to 200 Twins, 1965-1978. Nah, you don't need that. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't cover many, many bikes. Nah, uh, Honda CB400 and CB554, 1973. Don't let that get away from me. That's gold right there. That's printed gold. Yeah. Yeah, that's printed gold. That'll get stolen. That's a CB750, but smaller lot, and more complicated. I thought I had a whole lot more to give you, yeah. but I don't know if I put those away somewhere, and yeah. I don't know what happened, but yeah. I'm going to promise you, uh, when you're teaching CB350, because that's, that's the world. We talked about it earlier. Yeah. Um, every motorcycle that we're riding today, Dan's, Dan's Triumph 660, is based on that. Hmm. There's, there's a whole lot of CB350 in his motorcycle. I promise you. Uh, his his versus three six fifty. Mm -hmm. I can show you parts of that versus six fifty that are stolen from the Honda CB three fifty. My my CB three fifty probably has probably a couple <laughs> of items. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> but the principles that exist in a Honda CB three fifty motor can be shown. I can I can show you where that technology went because it was so goddamn far ahead of its time because it was based on the Honda three hundred five. Yes, which is the shit. Which is God's motor. I Fucking love that. <laughs> you're in good company. You and me both, baby. <laughs> I, I, you're not going to find anybody around here that's going to argue that that's a bad God. motor, except for Chris, who blew one up. Love that bike. I still, I still say, 
In Chris's defense, when, yeah. I always call him the least mechanical motorcycle rider I know. <laughs> <laughs> I gave him a screwdriver one time. He said, which end of this do I use? I said, well, you want to drive a nail with it? You use the big end. If you want to drive... <laughs> <you> use, <laughs> <laughs> when Chris told me he blew up the... When, when Chris told me he blew up the Superhawk, I was like, how did you blow up a Superhawk? And then he told me, well, I went out to this place and I came back to this place. And I went, I shouldn't have blown it. On the highway... At, you know, 80. Oh, okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. You may have stressed it. You may have stressed a little bit. That's okay. And it's a very, very old motorcycle. So even when he got it, it was already a very, very old motorcycle. So we, you know, rather than fix his motor, we just found another motor. Yeah. And we put another motor. Well, I went out Lake Road, which is nice and smooth. Beautiful. Come back 90. Which is speedy. Yeah, which is speedy. I feel your pain, and that, Chris. That, that bike is still haunting Nick to this very day. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, our last Blue Ridge trip, when we went down to the Blue Ridge Mountains, Nick, out of the six days, Nick spent four and a half in the garage <laughs> working on the bike. I feel like that was some of the best part of that trip, though. Me okay. And, me and my buddy Nick getting out and working on that, you know. Yeah, I think he actually built himself a new stator for that. You Rewound can say that. I did 420 miles on some of the most twisty, awesomest roads that there ever existed. Well, so yeah, that was fun, too. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. But. I just want to say that I think your concept is very good because I think when you learn how to do, like the machine, like the machine in your mind that learns how to put something together is more important than just rote learning. It's just like calculus too. It's the same way. If you know, if you understand how calculus works, not just like not just going through the steps, right. but understand the concept behind calculus, it makes it so much more, you know, so much simpler. Right. So and also more interesting. But if you have a practical you, application to anything. Right. And yeah. so once you do one thing, if deductive logic and inductive logic are the two things that nobody learns that you really need to solve any problem in the entire world. So these uh, CB350 motors that you're taking apart and putting back together again, taking apart and putting back together again, taking apart and putting back together again. Those of us sitting around the table have an understanding that some of the fasteners on a CB350 motor are made of Velveeta. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, possibly. How do you get around a whole lot of stripped out hardware? Uh, I mean, are you teaching kids how to helicoil? N no. Or are you just telling them, don't actually reef on it? No. So they learn how to use the impact driver. <laughs> Very important. Very right. important. The greatest so you mean the impact pool. remover? Yeah. Because sure. when you up say the word driver, that implies assembly. Oh, correct. You're right. That should ever only ever be used for disassembly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That, I, the impact take aparter. That's the greatest tool ever. <laughs> Holy you'll have fuck. no you'll have no argument for me, sir. I have one in my car. If you have a JIS, if you have a JIS That's bit, what I'm saying. and J an impact you have driver, to use JIS. Though. The do, have you discovered the vessel impacta? Uh, I've seen it online, but I've never ordered it. So I bought them one year. We all got vessels. We all got vessel JIS JIS <laughs> impacta <laughs> vessels. It yes. looks like a screwdriver. Yeah, and and clockwise, it works like a screwdriver. But then anti-clockwise, you can whack it, and it becomes an impact remover. Yeah, it, I thought that was, when I saw that, I was like, this can't be right. This can't exist. Right. This, this cannot exist for less than $1,000. Yeah. Right. And they come in all three sizes. Well, so Phillips were designed to twist out of the screw. Cadillac yeah, and General Motors made sure they could cam out. Yeah. Yep. Which has fucked every CB350 owner and CB750 you know funny? owner ever. The, like I can't believe like I only found out about JS like five or six years ago. I I have been on a one man campaign to educate people about JIS, yeah, including A V E, right. Arduino versus Evil, the Canadian fella. I sent him a letter and schooled him on this whole use of the term Phillips on motorcycle parts. Right. And I was like, my name is Philip Waters, and if you ever use a Phillips on a motorcycle made in Japan. You're not my friend anymore. Mm -hmm. Go fuck your hat. We don't want to call you Jizz, though. Right. <laughs> and you know what? The next, the, the very, like, next minute, he says, so one of my listen, one of my viewers, whatever, who runs a motorcycle shop, told me about JIS. Yep. And he went into the best description I've ever had. So I'm very proud that anytime anybody's like, what the fuck is JIS? I make him watch the video. Right. Because he describes it in shocking clarity of how one fastener 
was literally designed to be kind of perfect. But then the whole General Motors Phillips thing actually fucked it up. Mm-hmm. And because they wanted to save the tooling, not the, the right. The bolt. It's exactly what it is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They didn't want to make a device that could only torque it to a certain point, so they made a bit that would lose the fastener at a certain torque. Right. Well, that's great, except for when you're trying to take something apart right. and you're not whacking it with a hammer at the same time. And our engine casings for the bikes that we all like are made of a very firm form of cheese, Right. And so because our engine casings are brittle and scary and old, we can't whack things real hard. So we have to be gentle with an, Im- like with an impact. And damn if an impact wrench doesn't solve all your problems, taking apart a CB750 or a CB350. So the girls, yeah. the girls, the students. Or just get a dugga dugga dugga. Yeah. <laughs> How many dugga duggas? So they, one of the beauties is like common motor fully supports everything we're doing and they donate every single thing that we order from them. Are you kidding? Every. We can order camshafts from them and it is free. Okay, guys. So you got to support Common Motor. Common Motor is... And and so we get the bolt kits, the Allen yeah. Head bolt kits. Oh, yeah, kits, the Allen Head steel. bolt kits, yeah. They... He, Brendan, loves what we're doing so much. He was like, listen, either I can pay X amount of dollars in taxes every year, yeah. or I can spend the same amount of money in product and give it to something that I totally believe in, and right. then I don't have to pay Uncle Sam. I'm like, hey, yeah, I love right on, that man. Thought. Yeah. yeah. Well, so I mean, I'll much, give you a receipt. So then we teach the students <laughs> to retail. use the impact, or if they totally mash up that, that JIS Destroy fastener, yeah. then we show them how to drill it out. Ah! Think, of the, think about this for a second, though. Okay, so you have this, this school, and you're doing all this awesome stuff. So when you go to ask somebody to possibly donate, they look at you, and they go, okay, this is awesome. Because think about it. The rest of the week, there's some influencer somewhere like, well, I want to put a fucking snowmobile motor into my one. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm sure they just get the dumbest fucking request where, like, you got a whole package that it's, they're almost dumb not to. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We've had the, we've definitely had to field those kinds of questions from people like, well, we love this, but... Um, how about if we do Harleys? I'm like, we're not doing Harleys. How about if we do go-karts? I'm like, that's pretty cool, but that's not... Yeah. I don't know anything about that stuff. All I know are CB350s. That's what I'm sticking with. <laughs> uh, I don't know a damn thing you about it. You can't unlearn me. <laughs> yeah. You cannot <laughs> unlearn me. Uh, and, but you're right. You should stick with that because yeah. realistically, um, we can show a lineage from that motorcycle engine to everything else. And anytime the yeah. kids ruin a side cover or yeah. anything, we've got spares up the ass. Millions, literally over a million yeah. motorcycles were made that say CV350 on the side. And they're all in Michigan, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. Well, I swear to God. Yeah, most of them. It's insane. You no, know, people from Japan come here to buy them. It's true. Uh, no I'm, such I thing as a rare Honda. That's right. I threw it up on the list. Common Motorcycle Collective. Um, that's And what Common Motorcycle Collection does, Collective does uh, that a lot of other motorcycle shops or people that are trying to sell you parts for your vintage vehicle don't do is they have general maintenance FAQs and tech tips on their website. And this is where I like Common Motorcycle Collective. If you look on there, you can see I love the fact that I'm pulling one up right now that is literally their PDF for JIS fasteners and how they work and what their torque specs are. Because when somebody holds something up to me and says, hey, what's the torque on this? I said, do you know there's a sheet? Do you know there's an industry standard for that? And there is an industry standard for that. Good and, type. Uh, yeah, PFT. PFT. Yeah, it's just PFT. <laughs> no, no, that's RFT. Hold on. That's really fucking tight. Not pretty fucking tight. No, that's tell how long or what position you hold the ratchet at that's the other Here's one your torque is your torque exactly oh, yeah. right right so if you want 10 right. pounds you hold yeah. it at the our head. buddy jim and the motorcycles and misfits podcast just, now has a rule that just says, choke up on it he's yeah and he, you can even go down to a quarter drive <laughs> if you don't really want you start with a quarter drive so <laughs> J- naked jim naked jim's whole principle is i will have no tool in my shop other than a quarter drive <laughs> a quarter fucking drive ratchet because he's a big fella you know he's yeah. <laughs> And so Jim's a normal, like, adult-sized man working on small motorcycles. And he's like, well, if I only have a quarter-inch drive ratchet, how much harm can I really do? <laughs> and honestly, that's a pretty fucking good standard. Take a look right there. 
on, and, and I don't know how many times people have asked me this question. If you go to commonmotor.com, common-motor.com, you look at this, there is literally a JIS standard modification chart that you can look and see the cross-reference to JIS and modified JIS hardware. It's all right there. It's, it's right in fucking front of you. So this is stuff that will help you if you're building an old motorcycle. This is stuff that'll help you if you're beating your head against a fucking wall going, wait a second, how come I can't find this fastener? Well, because it doesn't exist anymore, Sparky. Yeah. They quit making them. The <laughs> Japanese guy died. We had a little bit of a tech question about that. Um, you know, you had a friend that was trying to find the right fasteners that hold the carburetor to the plate. And, you know, and it's like, well, what do you do there? Well, you might have to be creative or you might have to go buy another rack of carbs to steal the part or whatever. But, right. you know, I don't know. You know yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that was d a deal where we had somebody that did the cardinal sin, that which Honda has assembled, never as disassemble. You don't ever take a rack of carbs all the way apart. You can rebuild a rack of carbs without taking apart all the fiddly bits. Once you take apart the fiddly bits, you're never going to line them up the same way the guys at the factory did because that they made 90 million of them. You're doing one, and you're not going to put it in a jig and make it perfectly straight the way they did. And if you lose a fiddly bit like that very specialized screw or that very specialized spring... Or the spring flies off and you don't know where exactly it's, it came from or which direction yeah, it was it's oriented. it's an alternative universe now. It's gone. No, if you find it, even right. though you don't know how it was yeah. oriented on the shaft, like the tangs this way or that way or whatever. I'm going to promise you that kind of stuff, that kind of a resource, when you can get that knowledge and that exists, because I got bad news, folks. Last, year, last week, we talked about cheap Harley Davidsons, and we were all like very... Fucking freaked out on cheap. Today I was looking at Sportsters. I'm like, yeah, you can get a Sportster for about three grand. Yeah, you, <laughs> you know get, what? I want to get a Road King for seventy five hundred. Do you want to know what I want to talk about today? Parts huh? and who don't have them. Oh, Tom and I are waiting for unusually long periods of time on parts that are less than fifteen years old. Weren't you having a hard time getting tires? Even well, they they're start, they're helping that out a little bit, <laughs> but I'm talking about maintenance item wear and tear parts hmm. that historically speaking we wouldn't have a problem hey you want to hear cursing supply chain issues oh supply chain issues <laughs> oh that's just another word for corporate greed but you gotta understand it all works it's oe first oe gets the first part that's right truck downs cars down motorcycles down get second parts third parts go to aftermarket you're aftermarket sorry Woohoo. i told you that's it sorry i'm gonna promise you right now that we have had a bike in our shop for way too long. Yep. And it's a bike that is currently available <laughs> at the dealerships. You can go buy one. But getting a part for it was a 34-day wait. Now, I'm not talking about a bike that's 25 or 30 years old. We're talking a bike that is 15 years old, 14 or 15 years old. And we have seen this, and I tried to buy rebuild kits, not for, not for a name the bike so we can shame the bike. <laughs> Kawasaki W650. Yep. Whoa. Year of our Lord, two thousand and two. What's it? Or so two thousand. Low volume bike though, too, right? Hold on. That's example one. The carburetor kits for that do not exist on planet Earth anymore. Period. I don't care who you call. Don't care where you call. Giant pain in the dick just to get the float needles and the uh, float bowl seal. Forget about getting all the other stuff. It doesn't exist. Uh, but you can call Keister. Fuck my Keister. I've called them. I've called k and L. I've called all the Ks. I've called them all. I called the KKK. They don't have them. Nobody has these parts. Now, you, you think the, that's fucking weird. Do you try the Circle K? I tried the Circle K. Something How about a rebuild there. kit for the fuel control valve on a Triumph parallel twin motorcycle? meaning a Bonneville or any of the other ones, right, that has a carburetor. They made a lot. Of, they made like a metric shit ton of those. You know what? They don't exist. They don't fucking exist. Oh. They're gone. I call people in England who don't have them. Wait, what year? 2000. 2005. Because oh, no. mine's a 2001. No, and yours has the same problem and needs the same part. Oh, well, no, mine's working right now. Hopefully. At the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Put some more ethanol gas in and see what happens. The um, the Triumph Owners yeah. Forum? The Rat Forum. Rat Forum rat actually form. recommends changing it to a Pingle. 
They do. And it's like $200. $200 for the Pingle they recommend. Yep. Right. And it's not a direct bolt-on, by the way, too. you got to modify it. Right. Yeah, I noticed my KLR650 rotted up rather quickly, and I bought a, re- a real Kawasaki Ooh. one. You know, like if it was a cheap aftermarket, cheap rubber, but... And it, you know, it did the rotted out between the holes. Yeah, between the two holes. And yeah. now it's not. Yeah. It's, you know, how about any. Um, it's gefuckered. How about any pre Piaggio Aprilia? Forget it. Go die. Yeah, that's, a, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Right. Yeah, I mean, go that's die. That's another one. Right. That, that's another one. You're just gone. But the one that's killing us right now, the one that we are having trouble fucking squaring ourselves with, is a 2007 Suzuki 400, where I've called. Every Suzuki. DRZ? No. What's a 400? AN 400. Uh, uh, scooter. Uh, Bergman. Bergman. Oh. Bergman 400. The Boigman. The Boigman, which they still <laughs> sell. Mm-hmm. What? And this is a wear and tear item that you're supposed to replace every 10,000 miles. Th- that is a. <laughs> that, can you imagine the calls you're getting from the guys that. Because most guys that own Bergmans are between 70 and the dead. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, just they wait. don't text. And they don't text, <laughs> and they're not usually pleasant. Yep. There's never a pleasant conversation. No. So now you're going to tell I've this guy. I've had seven of these unpleasant conversations. Yeah, now you're telling a guy you can't get parts for his fucking favorite bird. I told him everything <laughs> he needs is in my shop right now, except for the belt. Yeah. Just, and so I said, I said, you know what, though? I'm an idiot, so you should go find one. Sure. So I'll tell you what. You bring me the belt. Don't don't trust me to do it. Well, he, rush the job. And you know what he said? He said, you're an idiot. I just found one on Amazon. Sleepy, tell the folks in the audience about how good Amazon Suzuki belts work. Well, not so even my Kawasaki one. Yeah, so I ripped apart that quad that I, I bought for nothing, and I got all the new... I'm like, oh, man, it's the clutch. So I got the new belt, I got the new spring, I got the new thing all through Amazon, put it in, and the fucking thing tried to go through the front of my garage because the, belt, the belt was the wrong size. The belt was the wrong size, too tight. It had no neutral. Now, wait, did you point. order it? Just Did you say, just send me a random belt? No, no. No, no, you ordered it by part number. Part number, specific okay. part number. Right. And it said it was a genuine Kawasaki thing. And did it come Amazon. in a package that suggested it might be a Kawasaki belt? No, it said no, Kawayama Hakasaki yeah. on the side of it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a universal belt. <laughs> right, but then guess universal? what happened? Guess right. what happened when I went to Kawasaki.com and bought the Kawasaki Lay it belt? Lay on me, brother. It was twice as much for that belt, yep. and the spring was the same price. It went in, and everything worked. It just fucking sat there Twice running. Twice as much as possible. How many times better did it actually work? A hundred times better. <laughs> and I didn't have to, if I would have picked that part first, I wouldn't have had to do the job three fucking times instead of just, you know, doing so it once. So my time. particular customer, who will be paying me money to do this job, mm-hmm. I assured him that the reason this is taking so long is because I did not want to resort to an eBay or Timu or AliExpress or Amazon Belt. Right. I said I will only be ordering you a belt that comes in a Suzuki package from Especially Suzuki. Especially for a drive belt, because that's not just a belt. That's that's what makes you go. Kind of a big deal. Yeah. The guides were unobtainium, and the belt was... <clears throat> we'll see you when we see you. Mm-hmm. Uh, he didn't like that answer. But the point being that... Why, he, though? Is this still, like, COVID catch-up? Like, no, or just whatever? It's still, it's like, why, why would they even produce those anymore. That's right. Yep. If you have well, your you choice... Still buy a, you can still buy one, you said. You can yeah, but it's different. Burger. I'm sure the clutch is a new it's different. different. It's different, though. Okay, so that's... There's been three different versions. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, parts do change. It's no longer in production. And a lot of vehicles, too, if you buy a certain vehicle, if you if you have a Kawasaki Versys, um, when you order parts for that Versys, you just don't pick up the phone and yell at the Kawasaki dealer, Versus 650, and hang up. They're going to want to know your VIN. <laughs> Because your fuel pump could come from four different manufacturers based on your VIN. Hmm. Okay? So we're used to dealing with a CB750 where all the carbs are the same carbs that are the same carbs for, you know, 10 years. Whereas with modern motorcycles, there could be a wild difference between your fuel pump or your fuel injectors or your ECU or something based on maybe a very small VIN range of these particular bikes had these particular parts supplied by this particular supplier. And if you put the wrong one on, shit don't work. So year, make, and model is no longer close enough, thanks to the guys at AutoZone. Uh, we love you, but year, make, and model won't get you home. <laughs> I, uh, I need a water pump for a Vespa yeah. GT200. Go. We're not even, and that's the thing, I, I wanted to try to keep this out of the realm of obscure scooter shit, because we could do obscure sh- scooter shit all day long. But our podcast listeners don't operate in that world. 
if you're doing a GT200 water pump, you're already a rare fetishist who's yeah. into weird fucking shit. Like, you appreciate those sheer wizardry of even having what you have. Nobody should own a 25-year-old Vespa or 20-year-old Vespa. You should own a 60-year-old Vespa or a new Vespa. But anything else is a no man's land that only brave, expensive people can go wander around in because the shit is rare. It's like the, the people who own X-Body uh, Chevys. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> um, or any Alfa Romeo. Yeah. Right? Okay. Don't so there, I mean, <laughs> there is this whole world... But people don't realize right now, I have never seen the shortage of parts, even during COVID. Now, COVID's well fucking over, guys. Well, I mean, you know. Oh, you're still yeah. getting it, Sleepy. <laughs> I understand you're carrying the torch, right? right. Since last week for some of you. But, I know. But COVID, as far as manufacturing is concerned, is no longer a viable excuse of why we only have 12 people in our factory due to social distancing. We should be geared back up again. And in my opinion, it is, uh, it is, you know, greedflation where manufacturers are saying, well, look at, we made so much money only producing 20% of what we normally produce by increasing the price 300%. Why would we ever need to make 100% ever again? Right. And the answer is because the guy in Cleveland might fucking need those parts, pal. Right. Oh, but we're losing all of our market. We're losing all of the buyers to the people buying them on Amazon and Timu and AliExpress and everything say, else. I was going to say, you know, is the OEM or the manufacturers like, well, we don't really need to support this whole. If I don't have a demand for it, because people are just going to go buy a cheapo one on online, so why bother? So you can't rely on the Chinese manufacturers to carry the weight of your industry if the product they're producing isn't going to work. Right. Right. So that's what it comes down to. So I have well, a question. Yeah. So if I have a hundred bucks, I wanted to buy a Harley or have a chance at a Harley. Is there anything I can do, or am I screwed? No, you know what? What if you wanted? What if you wanted a weird four hundred cc motorcycle too? An automatic. An automatic. <laughs> what if you wanted a four fifty Honda Matic? That's almost not as good just, as a Harley. Not a four hundred automatic. Not a CM four hundred A because nobody wants those. No. What about a four fifty Honda Matic? The true fucking rare bird that is the. Honda 450 automatic because mm -hmm. that's the one you want to have. Yeah. That's yeah. the rebel base. But motor. I only have Those are all great bikes. Now, if you only have $100, if you yeah. only have $100, you what can, can you do. You can go to the MotoGoCleveland.com website and basically what you're doing is you're donating 100 bucks to MotoGo to help us continue to bring our program to all these kids. And as a reward, you get a chance to win a. 2000 Harley Davidson Electric Glide. Whoa. The full package with all the bells and I whistles. I heard it has a cassette. Deck. It does have a cassette. Yeah. It's badass. I've yeah. seen it run. And right now, I think there's only 25 tickets that have been sold, and we're maxing out at, I think, 150. I think it was 150, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Now, so, did you guys get the George Thorogood song out of the deck? <laughs> no, it won't eject. It's okay. stuck forever. <laughs> Born to be bad. It's just in there. Yeah, bad to the bone. Bad to the bone is just in there. It will not come out. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's stuck. <laughs> Fuck yeah, man. That's super cool. All right, cool. And then, so... I'll donate when you give, uh, give away a C70. Well, but hold on. <laughs> Look, there's only one person in this room that I would ever imagine riding a Honda 450 automatic, a Hawk-O-Matic, a Honda-Matic, is you. Yeah, he should. I, I don't ride anything. I don't even drive anything with a fee manual. <laughs> <laughs> so then for the for the rider or the new rider or the want to be rider yeah who might not know how to use a stick shift and right. drive anything manual we have a 1983 Honda CM450 Honda Matic yes and those are 50 bucks a ticket and it's in that metallic Chocolate brown. Yeah, that just horrible Two -tone skid mechanic, brown. Two-tone mechanic skid mark brown. Yes. It skid is root mark beer. in your underwear brown. Yes. It's root beer. Thank you very it much. It is root beer, indeed. Yeah. It is root beer. Yeah. And the previous owner did kind of a little chopper thing to it and put these mini apes on it, and he's got the upswept pipes with the fishtail-looking things, and it is fucking sweet. It's the perfect jumping-off point for the... Bike of your dreams. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you don't okay. have to learn how to shift. No. And you're helping no. people. Yeah. And, it, and it's probably twice as fast as John's Versus. 
And, oh. when, and when you do win this motorcycle, it comes with Uh-oh. a membership to the garage now for you to value added. Screw around with the bike. That's oh. value added. Oh, well, now you I got to do that. Three month membership. Three what? Three some, whole months. Three whole some months. Some people are happy Jesus to have Grum Coffee It's like added. 500 bucks. That is amazing. Those are Molly's parents on the CB3. Uh, by the way, there. last year, by the way, Molly in her fucking prom dress yeah. looked amazing yeah. and bow and bow tie on Brian. I was like, like, is that her mom or is that her or who is no, that? No, no. These guys were super, super cool. The, uh, but what I did want to talk about is this whole idea of getting a raffle bike. Raffle, raffle, raffle. Um, I, this is a big deal. Yeah. If you don't want to just come up, I just put, I just put cash in his hand every year. I'm just like, I'm gonna, here, good job. Take, take some money. <laughs> good job. Right. Good job. Get, thanks, for not, thanks for me not being involved. <laughs> Every year, I give my brother money for having the children I didn't have to. Good thinking. He saved me a life of fucking trouble. Yeah, yeah. Right? And every year, I give Brian money for doing the idea I didn't have to. Saved me a life of fucking trouble. Yeah. Because I don't have the patience for it. Uh, I'm not an educator. <laughs> so uh, when, when I tell you guys that, that getting involved in this event, it's easy. March 16th. Now, if you're listening to this podcast, and if you were at Rheingeist Brewery a couple of weeks ago where we all got COVID, <laughs> if you were there... If you're out of the hospital. And you're out of the hospital. <laughs> you want to come to another community event. Another community <laughs> event. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be way less covid yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, you got to check your COVID at the door. I am going to fucking promise you I'm going to straight up promise you, with the number of people that came up to us at the Garage Brood Motorcycle Show last week, or last month, and said all the beautiful things you guys said about our podcast, mm-hmm. you we drove four hours to visit y'all. You can drive up here mm-hmm. because you will be happy. Yeah. This event is a fucking rollicking good event. Uh, we had so much fun there last year. We had so much fun the year before. You show up and you get a, you meet the people that are involved in Moto Go. See what Skidmark's all about. See the amazing, cool project bikes that are being built downstairs. You're going to have a good time. Have some badass drinks. We got a great uh, music thing happening. There's a kid I used to teach at School of the Arts. He's a professional saxophone player. He'll be playing some jazz. Uh, really cool gifts to you know win in the raffle beyond the Harley and beyond the Unbelievable CM450 Honda Matic, <laughs> but it's it's a it's actually a pretty damn good time. It's not a it stuffy a fundraiser typical thing. It's it's pretty fucking well, cool. Well, and you know what's neat is when you walk like so like you all the different events you guys do. We're there several times during the year. Like, sometimes it's cold, sometimes it's warm, but you know whatever. But what's interesting is when you walk in and you see all the benches and the bikes on them and stuff like that. Um, you can tell people about your community that you have going on there and stuff and like that. They can see a picture, but something about when you walk in there and you see like the bikes and like the creativity behind it's the some fucking of the bikes. smell. You walk into the yeah, place, yeah. and it smells like it's supposed to smell. But it's mm-hmm. like, but yeah. it instantly you get a complete feeling that it's not just a dude working on a bike. It's a community yeah. because and, you know you can yeah. see all the and, and you can see cool people's shit. Yeah, but you can also see like if you're looking on the right side and this guy's got a cafe racer and the mm-hmm. exhaust is a certain way. And then you look over here and you can see that this guy did his air cleaners like that. You know they're influencing each other and there's like right. different ideas bouncing oh, off and stuff. It's yeah. kind of neat. And like, Come on, you, Sinchi. Get, uh, get you Summit will, in there for uh, 10 Do you know what I, the most... I, I think 10K. They, 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 well, I don't know about that, but I think they did do <laughs> something. Do you know the one thing that I covet in the Skidmark garage is? Hmm. The poop knife? That's fantastic, but <laughs> I actually really like that Honda generator. Because I'm a, I'm a generator. Oh, yeah, he's a generator. That, that little yeah. tiny ancient one? Yeah, yeah they're, they're cool. That thing, yeah. I like those little suitcase ones. Yeah, that thing's really neat. Yeah. Greg got does it, that. Does it run? Does he have it running? Yeah, anything? yeah, and yeah, he, he gave it to me for my birthday. Oh, you did? Yeah. yeah. Get the fuck out of here. Yeah. Our, our friend Greg Castillo is this guy who's just like, if it's small, he's it's good. great. Yeah. If it's something that's for like one sixth action figures, the EM Greg's going to be driving it around the neighborhood. Yeah, yeah, the old sure. school EM four hundred, one of the first like portable little generators, in, and I keep looking at them on marketplace here and there, and they're not super practical, but they will. I mean, they yeah. they're they're cool. They're just yeah. really good looking. They're so cool looking. 
I got I got one last question for Brian. Hmm. I heard this rumor. I don't know if it's true or not. But so say you're a dude that wants to get into building bikes or something. I heard that you might have like a pile of old bikes that if you join or something like that, that you can or like something like that. So there are. Um, <laughs> 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 Becky's, Becky's like, our garage. <laughs> <laughs> if you need the first hit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Besides stealing Tom's motorcycle. first one's for free. <laughs> the, uh, we do have, at the moment, maybe eight or nine motorcycles, most with titles that have been donated. And, and I use them as kind of a, you know, like bait. <laughs> and if someone wants to come in and it's happened it doesn't happen as much as I thought it would but there have been people that came in and they're like hey I don't own a motorcycle I don't ride but I want to learn and I want to work on something I don't you want the community something. too yeah and so I'll say alright I got this bike here you can have it for free mm -hmm. as long as you buy a year membership is that green CB350 one of those bikes you had a green and white CB 68. Oh, yeah. no, that's a MotoGo bike. Oh. That thing is fucking sweet. I'll, I'll join for a year if I can anything, that, that anything that's got a reflector on the front of the front fender, yes, you're sir. like, I'm in. Yes, that's sir. it. Uh, so, yeah, we've got uh, like a Virago in there that's waiting for someone to do. There's a couple CB750s in there. There's a <gasps> couple really fun to work on Maxims. Why do you um, want to punish people? Yeah. <laughs> God. You got an XV920? I'm really looking to ruin my fucking life. <laughs> PC800. Oh, whoa, how, about a V40, how about a V45 <laughs> Sabre? Yeah. yeah. He's got, got a whole got V45 Sabre wing. Two on the Magna. There's a, a 75 gold wing. Or oh, 78 gold 70 wing. Gold. I saw the 78 gold wing. Yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's part of the thing, too, is... Um, the acquisitions department over at Skidmark. Yeah. <laughs> the fact that you've had to add a second floor where there wasn't a second floor. Yeah. Um, they've added a mezzanine yep. for no better excuse other than Greg well, Castillo. <laughs> that's pretty much the big reason. Yeah, we were up there uh, during your event. And he was like, yeah, that's mine. That's, that's mine. mine. I that's picked mine, that that's one mine, up. That's <laughs> mine. I'm just like, are you fucking kidding me? There's like, <laughs> you guys have motorcycles. You have a subfloor at six feet tall that's like the being John Malkovich room, right. right? Where you're like, nobody could ever stand fully upright in. No, it's just, it's just for the rando bikes that have been abandoned yep. or have been like, oh, no, really, I keep paying my dues. How much are dues? What's dues cost? Uh, just for storage is a buck fifty a day, if you remember. Wait, wait, wait. That's one dollar and 50 cents it's a 45 dollars a month yeah just for storage but if you're just a regular joe off the street that's right. not a member you're okay. paying three bucks a day okay so if you're a member what does membership cost membership is 180 a month 180 a month and that lets you keep a bike there right if you have an extra one that's right. the buck 50 so a day. for now i'm gonna say this for the cheap seats 180 dollars a month to hide a motor vehicle from your wife to have somewhere to go that you can hang out in that won't cause you a service charge, gratuity, et cetera, Free beer. where you can go work on motorcycles. There's a beer fridge, a stage, a pinball machine. Was there foosball last time I was in there? Yeah, foosball. Foosball? Pool table. Okay. You do realize what you've just made is a giant basement. Yeah, yeah, kind of. It's and a giant, giant fucking basement man cave thing. But there's right? also the tools that you always need and never have in your own garage. Uh, the, the big stuff. Yeah. yeah. And as, oh, no. Parts washers? Mm -hmm. Got those. Sandblasters. Sandblasters? Got those. You need a lathe? Well, you want to make, make your flannel shirt disappear? He's got one of those. <laughs> right? Second, I've been there. Second. And the shit's good. Oh, you want, a, you want a welder? How about 40 fucking welders? The man's got welders coming out his ass. And they're good welders. He's got quality fucking gear over there. There's no excuse to be like, well, I, I got stalled on my project. If you got stalled on your project, that's a you thing. Hmm. That's not a skid mark thing. They have the resources. They have the cool shit that you couldn't afford to put in your garage, right. let alone, look, our, our car shop, I can tell you what, what Snap-on charges hmm. to have a tire machine and to have an air compressor and cool shit there. I know what it costs, and it's a lot more than you're charging for membership. Fuck yeah, that's a good deal. That's a very good deal. Mm -hmm. And to have Brian walking around picking up your tools after you, that's priceless. Yeah. And, and should a 
mechanics garage feel threatened by a community garage? Oh, from day one. <laughs> from the one of the most adorable phone calls I've ever gotten in my life was Brian is like, "Hey man, you know, I really want to do this thing, but like, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to fuck you up." I, and I was like, I, the phone dropped for a second. I was on the ground laughing. <laughs> and I was like, dude, that's fucking adorable. Um, no, I want you to do this. Our biggest thing at the shop is not the bikes we work on. It's the bikes we don't work on. Mm-hmm. Okay? And nobody who, nobody who hasn't worked at a shop knows that. And some of you guys have worked at my shop and seen the way that I'm fucking militant about turning away bikes. Mm-hmm. And I've turned away some of your bikes. Okay? Because we cannot stay in business losing money. Right. And for so Buy many people, truck. one of our friends, Frischkat, said, we don't work on your shit. You want us to work on your bike? We don't work on your bike. That's your, one of the best commercials I've ever seen in my life was the one that you put together where they're just like, we don't work on your shit. But if you want to work on your shit and need help working on your shit... This is what they're all about. And I've sent so many people over there because when somebody comes in and says, hey, man, I got this CB750. I got it at a yard sale for $79.95. And I want you to make it perfect for me. And I got a $300 budget. And can you show me how to do it? And can, can you show I me watch how to do it? Can I watch? <laughs> what about somebody that wants to learn and maybe is operating on a budget? Right. A couple hours of shop time, you're over $180. Fast. That you could have spent the whole month fast learning it yourself. In my shop, he's going to give you a whole month, and I'm going to, I'm going to give you two hours. Right. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Not only is he going to let you watch, there are people there that will help you. If you try to watch Tom, I will fucking harm you. <laughs> okay? I had to redesign an entire fucking building. I had to take walls down and put walls up so that you can't see, hear, or smell Tom. <laughs> No shit. I feel like I want to snipe one of his members to come over in my garage and fix that. <laughs> How much do I have to pay to get you? You want to, work to sub? On my... You want to sub rent? Same. I mean, like that's called pay, trafficking, John. Like one month of your membership, will you come fix some of the bikes in my garage for like one day? Yeah. yeah. Make it make an exchange rate. Well, that'll yeah. be done right. That will be a skid mark away It'll mission. Certainly be done quicker and better than I'm doing it. Right. I mean, that's yeah. like. He could farm out. I literally have a CB, oh, a CL, right. 350, 72, right. gold. Yeah. It's been sitting on my lift for four sitting years. There. Four well, years. we know where the motor came from. $180 a month. It's I ready will... to go. I mean, <laughs> honestly, you could just probably, but it's just been sitting there. Yeah. Oh, but if you give it to him, just some kids are going to learn how to work on bikes. What's What good is that going to do? No Jesus way. Jesus Christ. It's not going to It's not going to do oh. what it's doing in your garage, just fucking holding the lift down. My whole garage will float Keep your away. garage from floating away. <laughs> if that bike lose, the whole garage will float away. <laughs> That's why, like, that's why we want to have you on, because not only is what you're doing important, but we can have a lot of fun with it, but because everybody here has projects they didn't finish. Everybody here has bikes that they had the best intentions of. I fixed other bikes, but that one just sat on the lift. Seems like once they go on the lift, that's that's where they get stalled out. <laughs> if it's in the middle of the field or out of the compound or oh, something, oh, then you're gonna right quick you know, in a hurry. Yeah, I'll get it running, right, you right, know, right. and I'll ride that. Right. But but if it's know, on that, the lift. Yeah, you, what did you Park. use for a gas tank on a motorcycle at Mid Ohio last year? Oh, it was the tank off of a power washer. Yeah, it was yeah. power washer gas yeah, tank. Yeah, yeah. and that became is, the gas tank. Yeah, the soap tank. Yeah, the what soap tank off of a power washer. Right. So at two hours and thirty-two minutes, Chris Smith has a joke for us. <laughs> Bring it on. You know what I think? <laughs> oh, oh, oh God. <laughs> 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 was that real? This fucking animals. <laughs> That's a fucking animal. Poisson, That's amazing. Johnny <laughs> Mac for the win. <laughs> he almost got his ass kicked at work for that. I can't believe that. <laughs> that was awesome. It's a fucking animal, I'm telling you. Wow. <laughs> the floor, dude. I felt that, and that's concrete. Oh my god, Jesus that was awesome! <laughs> fucking savage, god, man. Smith, oh save us! God. I didn't Rescue know us. we were allowed Jenny to. I've been holding one back for hours. spokesperson. <laughs> Poor Brian's over here turning eight shades of green like he's on a first date. 
<laughs> and I'm in the middle of these two fucking guys, man. It's not okay. All right. Little girl wants to take her dog for a walk and asks her mother whether that's she can take Lulu for a walk around the block. The mother says, no, sweetie, Lulu's in heat. What does that mean, the girl asks. Says, well, why don't you go out in the garage and ask your dad? The mother says. So the girl goes and asks her father in the garage, and he says, I want to take Lulu for a walk, but Mom says she's in heat, and i got to ask you about it. The father takes a rag, pours some gas on it, rubs it on Lulu's backside, to disguise the scent, now you can take her for a walk, he says. Just don't let her off the leash and she'll be fine. So the girl skips happily away, Lulu trotting along beside her. A few minutes later, she returns with an empty leash and no Lulu. Concerned, her dad says, where's Lulu, sweetie? Well, she ran out of gas half- halfway around the block, so the neighbor's dog is giving her a push home. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Smells like a skunk. Yeah. Uh, 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 <laughs> that oh. literally smells like oh. a skunk. Oh. <laughs> okay, before Damn, we go out. Smoke I think that's good. That's, 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 that's not my That's, that's like, skunk. Yeah. Wow. That's Somebody hit a skunk in the basement. I, yeah, yeah. I smell in my yeah. own hole first. Somebody hit a skunk in the basement. <laughs> I thought that came from your butthole. <laughs> Boy, I wish. Again. But no. March 16th. Smells better in here now. Now keep in mind, March 16th is special because March 16th is the day before St. Patty's Day. Yeah. Okay? So it's the day before St. Patty's Day. If you're going to be in Cleveland or near Cleveland, look it up. Moto Go, because I can tell you, we're all going to be there. Is that when I can pick up my bike after I I, uh, buy a ticket? Yeah. 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 Well, you don't have to be present to win. Oh, you don't? No. Okay. But they're going to make a big deal if you are. Yeah. Because last year, one of our friends won a motorcycle there. She is a guy, uh, she's a gal that we've known for quite a while in our little community, and we're kind of maybe an hour before they pick the ticket, right? So we're kind of all hanging around doing the thing downstairs, worshiping the bikes and the whole deal. And she comes up and she goes, "Hey, what do you think about that bike?" And it's it was just oh, a bizarre, yeah. weird customs three fifty, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, it was a freak show of a bike. That thing was awesome. Fucking like seriously, this is a freak show of a bike. And so we we're like, oh well, you know, that's a that's a really cool bike. That's pretty neat. Jesus. And we started looking at it closer and closer and closer. And we realized what a mutant this motorcycle yeah. was. And we're like, this is literally this is the raffle bike. This is the bike they're giving away. And she goes, Yeah, this is this is what we're doing. No shit. Two hours later, I won the bike. <laughs> now she's showed up to every we do DGR and we sometimes we've been starting DGR from from Skidmark for the past couple of years. Because we think it's important. When I have control over human beings and motorcycles, I will show. I will make sure they see Brian's shop. I always make sure that people, when they're doing DGR, get scared on the ride, mm-hmm. drunk on the drinks, and learn something. So we started it. We started it at uh, the the museum. Mm-hmm. We started at Crawford Auto Museum, and that's the Western Reserve Historical Society, so they can learn something, right? And then we started doing it at Brian's shop. So we started doing it at Skidmark because every fucking year that we do this, people roam in. They're like, did you see that fucking BSA? Did you see that Norton? Did you see that whatever? And it becomes this weird living museum thing that is people working on motorcycles. And plus, it's a great place to start an event mm-hmm. because it's east side of Cleveland. And, you know, for some of the people that come in from the suburbs, they get scared. You got a spool to stand on. Fuck yeah, I got a spool to stand on. I'll <laughs> shout at motherfuckers. <laughs> I don't need that damn fucking bullhorn. <laughs> um, but like that's that thing. This event, giving away two motorcycles, right? Drinks, cocktails, food, music, the whole goddamn deal. And at the end of it all, you can say you participated in a cultural charitable event. Yeah. For most of our podcast listeners, that's a never. Yeah, I don't, yeah. it's, I don't think that, the vast majority of motorcycle riders mm-hmm. are fundraising attendee type people. No, I, I this never is was. Cheaper than going to see the descendants. This is cheaper than going to see Into the Woods. Don't do that. It's a fucking terrible play. It's it's cheaper than seeing anything at Playhouse Square. Or going in fear. Right. Going thousand dollars. Oh God. <laughs> If your wife says, oh, we're going to go see this thing at the Playhouse or whatever, you're going to be trapped for four hours of <laughs> shit show, uh, like two hours of entertainment with an intermission and overpriced beers and the whole deal. Don't do that. <coughs> Take her to a cultural event. 
Take her to a gathering of artists and builders and musicians and cool shit. Take her to that event. Go to Moto Go. Because I assure you, after four hours, you will be super happy that you did. Yeah. And you'll know that every penny that you fucking put into the box went into doing the shit we're talking about tonight, yeah. which is brilliant. It's a one-to-one return on your investment. His management overhead is squatouche, as Chris would say. The man, <laughs> the, the man came in here today wearing at least $4 worth of clothes from the thrift store. His Moto Go shirt that he made himself is probably the height of his ensemble. <laughs> He's not living large on this 501C. Or, yeah. yeah, right. right. <laughs> we know people that have boats because of charity. <laughs> we know people that have campers because of charity. This is not that kind of a thing. No. No. Brian's legit. He, he gives but exactly all you probably sleep all pretty fucking good at night, right? I do. Yeah. I, when honestly, you're doing good shit, it has to make you feel good. Right? It does. It does. Even when it's a stressful thing to try and make it all happen... If I slow down for five seconds, and I'm like, God, I'm doing something that makes me feel fucking fulfilled. Yeah. And I want to circle back to something, too, Brian. When I asked the one question about success stories or how I, I want you to get the affirmation of some kid that was there on a Saturday morning, didn't want to be there, had a case of the ass. You turned him around, and he comes back, you know, five years from now or whatever, and he says, hey, I just designed a motorcycle. Or you see a guy that's like, I work for NASA now because of the mechanical shit you taught him on a Saturday morning. That's what I was driving at when I, I wanted like, to say, like, you know, you talked about the light bulb going off. That's the ultimate light bulb going off. Like, somebody, like, really, like, that it sunk in and they moved 100% forward from, you know, the experience that you gave them. Yeah, so. that's, that's the grand, like, that's the pie in the sky hope that every single teacher has. And, and we kind of went through this when you were walk when you were asking us about all our shop class experiences you talk to any person that had shop class and almost every single one of them will remember that teacher's name Mm -hmm. and will say that it was the most impactful class they had Mm -hmm. and it was the reason that they did this this and this afterwards and it's the reason why they still do something else and they still keep in contact with that like it is um by and large proven over and over to me all the time that it was the most important class that people had when they were in middle school and high school and because the state doesn't test it and because insurance (laughs) makes it impossible to continue to have it it is fucking wiped off the face of the earth we had a mechanic that used to work for us that became a coach at his shop they became a coach for motogo said it was one of the absolute most fulfilling things that ever done because of the feedback they got and the response they got from working with young people and sharing their knowledge and their education with young people and how it changed their life because that is a big fucking impact. That's a huge deal. When you stop saying, okay, and this is a person that was on a track that they hadn't been a mechanic for 25 years. They were a person that learned how to be a mechanic by working at our shop. We took them on as an apprentice with no mechanical background whatsoever and they became a mechanic working for us and they went to coach for Brian at Moto Go. Then we talk about our friend Steve Noble who was working for fucking Super Track and NASA. Okay, who decided he wanted to make a radical fucking left turn in his life and do what? Start educating people and start sharing his love of motorcycles. He teaches Harley Davidson classes. He teaches how to how to be build V twins. He teaches carburetor classes. Steve Noble uses Skid Mark. Uses this facility. He started. He used that as a literally a springboard into something that he's never been happier in his life. I've known him for a long time. I've never seen him happier than he is now doing what he's doing, educating people in the world of motorcycles. Now, you want to hear the crazy thing? Steve Noble hasn't owned Harley Davidson's for 30 years. (coughs) Steve Noble hasn't been like, oh, you cut me, I bleed Harley Davidson. No, when I met him, he had a Triumph sport bike and he was doing wheelies. Right? He had triple. He had no desire to own a Harley Davidson (coughs) V-Twin. He's completely altered his whole trajectory in the women in his life, like everything in his world shifted Because he finally got away from the corporate world where somebody told him he had to be, and he got to embrace his passion and do things that he loved, and he loves, and he's good at it. And isn't being happy the shit? It is amazing. Well, that should be the point of everybody's life. It's really shit. Do what you love, and you'll never work a day in your life. And that's why these two guys shovel shit. That's just the best thing. Like, they're (laughs) turd herders, and they love it. Uh, But... 
there is an absolute thing to that getting away from an oppressive job, getting away from something that's holding you back, getting away from something that's holding you down. For students, if we could go back in time and we could free ourselves as a teenager when we were 13 or we were 14 or we were 15 and break free from somebody else pushing us into a pigeonhole mm -hmm. that we were never going to fit in mm -hmm. and take, get back all the time we lost and all the passion that we lost and get that to be redirected into something cool. The funny thing is when I talk to people that are your, your students and your participants in MotoGo, these are not people that a year ago said, I really want to be working on motorcycles. They're not. They have other dreams and goals and passions. But it popped up and it became available to them. And it was something different to do. Remember that a lot of these kids are doing this on their own fucking time. And that's another thing that they're, they're basically saying, I have my regular schoolwork to do. I have my regular workload to do. But I'm also doing MotoGo. And it killed me when I talked to some kids last year at the benefit who are putting so much of their own time into this. Yeah. That's amazing. Like yeah. you talk about in addition to being on a soccer team, in addition to being on in the band, they're also doing Moto Go. That's crazy cool. Yeah. That's neat because kids are being pulled in a lot of directions right now. They sure are. And to see that they want to go do that, these kids are not the kids that have the born to ride tattoos. <laughs> These are not kids listening to Judas Priest and watching Sons of Anarchy. That's not the kids that are in the fucking program. No. Um, the kids that are in the program are majorettes. The kids that are in the program are, are smart kids. Again, if you're listening to this yeah. and you're a student of uh, Skid Mark Garage, uh, you could come join John McElfresh Garage for free, <laughs> and I have a lot of motorcycles that you can work on absolutely free of charge. Um, I might even let you ride them. So again, that's uh, www.vintagehondamotorcycles.com. But don't get in his van. <laughs> that's. I mean, has anybody else got anything else? The free candy. I got is one more lie. thing. Go ahead. Fire away. A uh, reading assignment for the class. Oh, oh. Mm -hmm. And I know some people at this table have read this book, and it's really expands. If you upon... say shopcraft is soulcraft, I'm gonna kiss you. Please do, because I will where I'm kiss going. you now. Shop class as soulcraft by Matthew Crawford. It was a New York Times bestseller, yeah. and this guy, his whole thing is lamenting the loss of shop class in high schools mm -hmm. and the effect that it has on society at large. I've handed know? that book to 20 people. Mm -hmm. I think I got it from Johnny Mac yeah. 10 years ago or something. Yeah. And Our friend Chad McDade's in that book. He's a BMW mechanic out of Chicago, Illinois. He's one of my favorite people. Uh, Shopcraft as Soulcraft is an amazing book, and it really is. Yeah, yeah. we're doing that as a, a book club with everyone in MotoGo right now. Wow. We've been reading chapter by chapter, and we are in the middle of trying to get Moto go at Hiram College. Oh, wow. Because I think it's important that freshmen learn how to fail before they just freak themselves out. You know that. Yeah. Unfortunately, the suicide rate between a freshman college students is abnormally high, yeah. and the rate of failure contributes to that. And if we can get them to understand failure is normal and acceptable, and it's part of learning, and I think that book is important. So we, I was thinking. We do Moto Go at yeah. a college level, and we make college level reading, and we discuss the book as we're doing it. Jesus, how Christ. fucking cool would that be it's to have philosophical cool. discussions as we're doing it? Have you ever listened to a motorcycle podcast and gone on the deep philosophical shit that we go into <laughs> when he's not farting or you're saying, <laughs> Believe it or not, there's quite a brain trust here, and it's not philosophical; it's philosophmoric. Philosophmoric, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, philosophmoronic. Uh, I have no problem with it. This is the evolution of that, right? Well, you're there. helping you get there. <laughs> yeah, I I you there. You're killing it with the, the idea that, like, you know, there's not one hugely su successful person in the world who hasn't failed a thousand times. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 I believe me. It's it's the whole thing is his acceptance of saying, "Wow, the first thing we can do is teach people how to fail." Right. Holy shit. One of the worst days of my life was teaching Doctor Waters how to throw a frisbee. <laughs> oh. You guys, oh. if I had a gun, I'd have shot myself. I felt so bad because <laughs> trying to teach somebody how to throw a frisbee is like trying to teach somebody how to chew. It's something that I've known how to do since I could hold one. It's just 
fucking obvious. I think if it falls out of your head, it goes somewhere. It's like... <laughs> 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 Did you use the your feeding chickens or whatever? See, what yeah, am I, oh. uh, what am I, uh, my one of the thing one of my things is you still haven't lost, you still haven't truly failed unless right. you quit. Right. So as long as you still keep trying, yeah. you haven't really failed. Turns you, out my wife will stick with a fucking piece of plastic for about six and a half hours and cry the whole time. <laughs> right? But the problem is my wife has been good at everything her whole life. She paid pro, she played literally college softball on that level that you're like don't hit me with that. Oh, right? like the fast pitch. Super under? fast pitch. Whoa. Right. If you ever, if you want to go play catch with my wife right now, <coughs> she will fuck you up. Man, Your hand Molly, will hurt. Molly played college softball too. See, what this is fuck? it. I'm, I'm telling you, this is ah. You got to learn how to fail. Yeah. You got to learn how to not succeed. Those people that were in the military learned that on day one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We learned how to fail. We learned how to fail hard. And we learned how to do push-ups for failing. And we were bad at those push-ups. So we got to do more push-ups. Cleveland right? Moto Podcast, failing since 2011. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cleveland Moto, going out of business. since. <laughs> it starts with Cleveland. <laughs> there you go. And it gets worse from there. Right? That's it. Anybody else got anybody else? No. Fuck wait, it, wait, man. Yeah. What the fuck is this thing? What? Oh, That's a this fireplace. Is a, this is an alcohol fireplace. You put grain alcohol in there, and it becomes a beautiful little fireplace. But we keep forgetting yeah. to buy grain but alcohol. We keep, <laughs> we, we, we we keep quitting to buy eco-fuel. Yeah. No, biofuel. Yeah, yeah. Bio, biofuel. Bio the Portuguese fuel. grappa only went so far. It went for about three minutes, maybe four minutes. It was a nice flame, but it wasn't the best flame. Right. Poop is flammable. Jacob, well, me think. Well, yeah. so that's the gas on a giant. That <laughs> component of it was. Like, it's so it actually depends on what the uh, volatile content <laughs> is in it. So, so my guys, uh, thanks be- for having me. Before we check out, Brian, thank you so much for coming here and representing Moto Go and Skidmark because we we do love that too. Um, I'm going to tell you, there's a culture right now happening in America, and I got a problem with it. The problem is with a culture called pretend and extend. Pretend means pretend like things aren't really really bad. And extend means, you know, make some more slack, make some, and you know what, things are going to get better, right? Pretend and extend. Ignore what's going on around you and just make a few more payments and it'll all get better, mm-hmm. okay? Um, throw money at the problem, whatever you're going to call it. Pretend and extend. I've been noticing that and kind of kicking around the shop, talking to different people about it. You know what? I'm going to go back to the old days. Maybe we should be the change we want to see in the world. Yeah. Maybe we should take a minute and instead of grousing about something and being like, that's fucked up and i'm going to share how fucked up it is my grandfather used to say nobody got a gold star for pointing out the problem but i'm the over it of- i'm ready to become part of the problem for so long <laughs> i've been part of the solution and i'm just done i'm here to tell john you, is flipping the switch the I'm other way hard the let me wait i'll leave you with this this was really interesting yeah every science fiction movie about time travelers right yeah, yeah, yeah. every single one is right. like if you go back in time don't even step on a caterpillar. Right, it can change butterfly the future. Effect. Yes, right. Well, how come we can't do that now? Why right. can't we step on a butterfly now right. that's going to do something? And that's for- my point. My point is, yeah. please, 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 everybody, do something fucking cool for somebody else. Yeah, right. I'm, I'm going to tell you, this Small is a weird things thing. things add up. Except if for you, I John. Go back in time and kill that fish that walked out of the water and created a human. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah right. <laughs> no, right. Also, I think you need to take responsibility. Yes, absolutely. Own up for something. Own something. Be something. Produce something. Be a change. Be be the magnet that attracts another person to go, that's fucking cool. Because I'm sitting in a room right now with a bunch of people that have very little to do with each other outside of this stupid thing that we do right here, and we've been doing it for a really long time. But we have affected at least 5,000, 6,000 people a month, right? Or a week in some times, right? So share that. Find something that you Just you're... don't ask me for help. I can't help you. In fact, I need you to help me. <laughs> Jesus. Don't pretend and extend anymore. Just fucking put some rubber well, on the road. John rib. can't extend yeah. anything. No, he's going to distend pretend. is what's going to happen. <laughs> All right. So thanks, guys. It's been a fucking riot. Ride fast and take chances. Play us out of here, Johnny. Hit the right button, eject, 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 get us out of here, sweetie.